say we can start. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from the lunch break. And uh, I will be the chair for this afternoon session where we have an invited talk first, and then we have four talks. So let's start with our invited talk. We have Francois Ligaret. I would like to introduce him a little bit. So, uh, I mean, everybody knows him, but he received the master in 2001 supervised by Professor Andre Van Rauch, and she did a PhD uh, finished in 2004, co-supervised by Professor Van Rauch and Korkum in chemistry at the University of uh, Sherbrooke. And then he got a postdoctoral fellowship. He actually worked at Harvard University in collaboration with Professor Bjorn um, uh, on tissue imaging with advanced microscopy techniques. And then he joined ENRS in 2006, and he became a full professor in 2013, and he has been the director of the Canadian Advanced Laser Light Source since January 2013. And today he is presenting as high energy multidimensional solitary states in hollow core fibers. Francois, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to give uh, this talk today. Um, I would prefer to be uh, in person for sure, but given the pandemic, uh, yeah, it's more safe to, to stay home. And so thank you very much for the invitation. And hopefully we will see each other in person at the conference soon. So the title of my talk is High Energy Multidimensional Solitary States in Holocore Fibers. This work was done at the Advanced Laser Light Source, which is located at INRS near Montreal. So uh, the goal of my research is to perform dynamic on the ultra-fast time scale, whether in molecules or atoms. Uh, I am mostly interested by let's say 10 to 100 femtosecond. Uh, of course, in this field of research, uh, some groups are also pushing to the attosecond time scale. So um, to enable this science, uh, there's a lot of work worldwide uh, to develop uh, X-ray sources delivering ultra short pulses. Uh, of course, uh, if we have a lot of money, uh, we can build a free electron laser. Um, so if I look at the cost of a free electron laser, which is about a billion dollar, this is the entire funding given to the Canadian community every year in natural science and engineering. So if I want my own free electron laser for one year, all my colleagues will have no funding. So we need to scratch our, uh, our head and think about other approaches uh, to uh, generate uh, X resources. Um, in uh, university-based uh, labs. And one of this approach is high harmonic generation, uh, which was described in 1993 by the three-step models of, uh, introduced by Paul Corcoran. Uh, in this model, uh, what it said is that the maximum photon energy that you can generate is given by this very simple formula as IP plus 3.17 UP. Uh, most probably most of you know about this formula, but I thought, uh, since I imagine they are like first year students attending this meeting, this is the key formula to understand high harmonic generation. So in this UP, which is the ponderomotive energy, uh, you have UP is uh, proportional to the intensity times lambda square, lambda being the, la the laser wavelength. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot increase the intensity uh, as much as we want. I mean, there are many lasers in the world that can deliver 10 to 19, 10 to the 20 watts per centimeter square. We cannot use these lasers to generate gas phase harmonics because, uh, for, the, for example, for the case of helium, um, the maximum intensity you can put is about 10 to 15, and I will say even a little bit below. And so this defines the maximum intensity, then the maximum photon energy you can get at a fixed wavelength. So at 800 nanometer with a regular TISAF laser, UP is 60 EV. 
And then when you do the calculation, you arrive to a maximum photon energy of about 200 EV. In the lab, most groups are getting up to 150. And then in the infrared, if we will be able to use 10 to the 15, in fact, we mostly use 5, 10 to the 14, we will get to uh, 500 EV uh, cutoff, uh, which is basically covering almost the entire water window spectral range. So there's a lot of interest, and in particular, a lot of work in my group to develop this kind of laser source. So I just want to highlight a paper that we have published in 2018, where we have shown that using a high energy multi-cycle 1.8 micron pulses, we can generate harmonics up to uh, 500 EV of photon energy, covering almost completely the water window spectral range. How we do this, uh, we have developed a high energy OPA. So we start with a commercial uh, OPA from light conversion that we pump with five millijoule. And then at the output, we have some millijoule of energy and that by further pumping with a high energy Thai Sapphire laser 45 millijoule, we can get up to 10 millijoule at 1.8 micron. But um, this 30 femtosecond uh, for many application is not short enough. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of papers that indicate uh, that it's much better to use few cycle pulses to generate high harmonics. So we want to further reduce the pulse duration of these infrared laser. So the technique that we are using is holocore fiber compression. I just want to mention we are celebrating this year the 25th anniversary of holofiber compression, thanks to uh, Moro Nizoli and co-workers. Uh, this, uh, this basically, uh, their ID uh, in the 80s, um, the group of Schenck has shown that we can use cell phase modulation in a solid core fiber to perform spectral broadening through cell phase modulation and compression. The problem with these solid core fibers is they cannot sustain high energy pulses. So the bright idea of Nizoli and co-workers was to replace the solid core fiber by a hollow core capillary that we fill with a novel gas. And then through this, we can have cell phase modulation and add the output, the red color that are generated are in the leading edge, while the blue color are in the trilling edge. And this is basically just coming from a simple formula that the instantaneous frequency is the derivative, is related to the derivative of the uh, pulse envelope. So with cell phase modulation, we can generate uh, broadband uh, pulses. And then at the output of the hollow fiber, we have a negative, uh, sorry, we have a positive chirp almost. And then with the uh, development of chirp mirrors in the 90s by the group of Ferenc Krauss and co workers, by combining this together, we can generate very short pulses. Uh, out of TISAF laser by spectral broadening and pulse compression using shock mirrors. So I consider this as a major milestone in ultrafast optics, uh, at least for me, if, uh, if I will, have, if, if all of fiber will not exist, uh, there's a lot of work that I will have not done within the last 20 years. So I consider this as a major milestone and thanks to Mizuli and co-workers for this great idea. Even though uh, we are celebrating 25th anniversary, this hollow fiber compression is still a very active research. I told you before, at ALS, we have access to this really high energy optical parametric amplifier. So using an ID that was proposed by Nagy and co-workers in 2008, where they have used a flexible fiber, rather than a rigid fiber. So they take a flexible fiber that they mount 
in a holder uh, by stretching it, uh, you can now get access to all of fiber that are much longer than one meter, which is the typical length for the rigid fiber. So our idea uh, following Nagy was to take this uh, stretch fiber, but instead of using a uh, holder to stretch it, to just put it between two holders, like a chord and a guitar. And so now we have access to set up that are above uh, six meters of length for the hollow fiber. In this case, we have used three meters and we have shown compression from 11 millijoule to six millijoule with 12 femtosecond pulse duration at the output. Uh, in collaboration with the group of uh, Professor Andros Baltushka, we have shown that this technique can be extended to the mid infrared. Here is a report where we have compressed uh, 3.2 uh, micron uh, pulses out of an OPCPA. So from about 80 femtosecond to 20 femtosecond. I just want to uh, briefly mention also other results that we have obtained with the group of Andreas in Vienna. In fact, I have two students who spent a lot of time in Austria within the last three, four years. Uh, we have compressed a kilohertz ethereum system from uh, about 200 femtosecond to 18 femtosecond. And recently, we have shown the compression uh, again in the lab of Andreas uh, from 70 millijoule to 40 millijoule at the output of the hollow fiber compressing from 230 femtosecond to 25 femtosecond using a one millimeter core fiber of three meters of length. So uh, this is the first demonstration of uh, ter terawatt peak power for femtosecond pulses out of an ytterbium laser. In uh, this paper, uh, Guan Fan did some modeling uh, and he, uh, from the modeling, it suggests that we could use this approach to compress alpha joule uh, laser from one picosecond to 50 femtosecond uh, with a 70 persons throughput. And this will end up in laser pulses with more than five terawatt of peak power. And I believe that this will be an important technology for driving not high harmonic generation, but rather laser wake field ex electron acceleration and betatron radiation in the multi key EV spectral range. And this will enable to build machine to perform time resolve uh, X-ray spectroscopy above the K edge of the oxygen, which is really difficult to get with high harmonic generation. So I think there will be a shift in the coming years for tabletop X-ray science where these laser wake field acceleration beamline that were built on 100 terawatt laser, we can drive them also with five terawatt and we could uh, build kilohertz uh, ultra short X-ray sources, ultra short art X-ray sources. <clears throat> now I want to switch to the real topic of my talk today. So, um, so far I have shown you results on hollow fiber compression with, uh, with noble gas. A few years ago by accident, and I have the can with me. Uh, you see the scan, uh, I use this to clean my computer to remove the dust. In the scan, uh, they are hydrofluorocarbons. And by accident, a few years ago, one of my postdocs was just cleaning the input of a fiber that was uh, installed on the optical table in air. And after uh, cleaning, uh, he saw massive broadening. And he didn't realize that it was because of these hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, so he left for lunch. And after lunch, he, came, he went back. The system was not uh, uh, with the closed cell, so the gas was not there anymore, and there were no more broadening. Um, so I remember we were making the joke of uh, air as change during lunch. Of course, uh, it's a joke. Uh, so we realized that it's these uh, molecules that were 
enhancing the broadening. And so um, there's different types of them, uh, R134A, R152A, tetrafluoroethane, difluoroethane. So uh, the nice thing with them is they have an ionization potential uh, very similar to xenon, but their price is really cheap. And so to conclude uh, on, on these uh, refrigerant molecules, what we have shown in this, in this paper published in uh, 2018 is that the uh, care index of R152A is about three times than krypton, which is similar to xenon. But while doing this work, I thought, well, there are other molecules with lower ionization potential. So this should work even better to uh, broaden uh, low energy pulses. And so we tried ethylene. But then with ethylene, to our surprise, the spectra doesn't broaden towards the blue. So you see here the curve in magenta. This is the spectra for ethylene. So uh, we see the same broadening to the red, but we see a suppression of the broadening to the blue. Uh, so we were wondering why. And so I have a student, uh, Reza Safai. He's really good with uh, writing codes to perform numerical simulations. And he did some simulations where he has include the Raman term. Uh, so instead of only assuming cell phase modulation, by including the Raman term, the vibrational Raman term and the rotational Raman term, we can explain the suppression of the generation of blue light. So we were thinking, OK, uh, what is the Raman contribution? Uh, is it the vibrational one? Is it the rotational one? And it's mostly the rotational one, because for the vibrational one, the response for the vibration is really, really short. And so we will need sub-20 femtosecond pulses to see the contribution of the vibrational one. And this is from our simulations. And so from this, we thought, OK, instead of using ethylene, let's use nitrogen. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but one of the problem with ethylene is if you ionize a little bit of ethylene in your olofiber, your olofiber will become dark, black. You will have no transmission. And this is because when you ionize molecules with double and triple bonds, like these ethylene, acetylene, you create very uh, reactive radicals that are then uh, kind of poly uh, making polymers, you know, uh, so it ends up into a dark, dark carbon or dark uh, in, in the hollow fiber. So don't use these ethylene and acetylene in your hollow fiber. If you ionize, you will make them, uh, you will damage them. But nitrogen, the advantage is if you ionize nitrogen to nitrogen plus, nitrogen plus is very stable and will not damage your hollow fiber. So we have compared uh, argon and nitrogen, where argon is based on cell phase modulation and nitrogen is based on Raman, we change the pulse duration. And as we change the pulse duration, we change the pulse energy to maintain the peak intensity. So you see that for argon, there's less and less spectral broadening as expected, while for nitrogen, the maximum broadening is not for the shortest pulse, but rather for 120 femtosecond pulses. Why is this? When you have 120 femtosecond pulses going into a hollow fiber, you induce a, a kick to the molecules. This is very well known in uh, gas phase molecular physics. You induce what we call non-adiabatic molecular alignment, and this leads to spectral broadening because as your laser is going, you give a kick, you make your molecule align. As your molecule are aligning, you have a time-dependent refractive index. And from the derivative of the time-dependent refractive index, 
you get spectral broadening. And we can show with very simple formula that maximum spectral broadening is at 120 femtosecond because this is the optimal pulse duration to, uh, to make the most efficient non-adiabatic alignment of nitrogen. So here are the simulations at the bottom, experiments on the top, and we kind of reproduce the experimental results where we see maximum alignment near our maximum broadening near 100 femtosecond. So that was published in 2020 by Guan Ju Fan, former postdoc of my group and co-workers. But then came the surprise. So from the simulation, which assume propagation in the fundamental mode, we expect to see no broadening or a massive suppression of the broadening as we increase the pulse duration. So as we increase the pulse duration, we should turn off the Raman contribution and the broadening should come back to only cell phase modulation. While in the experiments, even though we stretch the pulse up to a picosecond, we see more or less the same spectral broadening. I want to mention here to make it clear, as I change the pulse duration, I change the pulse energy to maintain the peak power the same. So this was like a big surprise. How is it possible that with sub picosecond laser, we can obtain massive spectral broadening from nitrogen? And so, at the end, why so much broadening? We take sub picosecond pulses with five millijoule. We go to the holofiber. 1D simulation indicates that we should see only cell phase modulation, while experimentally, we see this very, very broadband pulses shifted towards the head. Okay. One of the things that was for me a big surprise. So when you look at this spectra, our eyes cannot see anything above 700. But one of the thing we, we, that we can see when we drive this in the hollow fiber is some white light at the output that looks like, like a very bad flash lamp. Uh, it's not like this with cell phase modulation. So, when we look only at the light where our eyes are visible, visible uh, or where our eyes can see, the output of the hollow fiber looks like a very bad flashlight, not as a laser beam. So what we did is we took a long pass filter to select only the light above 850. And then above 850, we take images of the beam in single shot. And you see very nice repetability a very nice clean beam as if we have some self-trapping. And then we put a bandpass filter at around 780, which is the central wavelength of the TISAF laser. And then we see every shot a different mode with really high hoarder modes. So from this experiment, we realize that the, the pump beam, so the 800 beam, doesn't propagate into single mode. It propagates in multi-mode. So Reza with Guanju, they have worked together. Reza had a lot of uh, skills for uh, computational, uh, computational science. So he generalized his equation to take into account uh, higher modes in the hollow fiber and he was inspired by the work of uh, Logan Wright uh, from Cornell, where uh, they have looked at multidimensional nonlinear propagation in solid core fiber uh, in the group of Frank Weiss. So we have a dope, uh, the, we had one D simulation, and then we have expanded to take into account uh, the modes and the higher modes. And then the magic happened. 1D simulation fails to reproduce the experimental results, while the MD simulation nicely reproduces the spectral broadening. Here we have 700 femtosecond pulse at the input, and we 
change the pressure of N2 in the hollow fiber. How does it work? From the numerical simulation, we can look at uh, what is happening in the hollow fiber. So we work at a, at a power near the critical power for self-focusing. So as the beam gets into the hollow fiber, it couples to higher modes, LP02 and LP03. And as you have like uh, intermodal coupling, uh, this enhance uh, the broadening through the Raman process. And we could see that from the simulation within few centimeters of propagation in the hollow fiber, we basically generate the bandwidth to sustain these MDSS pulses, these multidimensional solitary states. And so these new colors that are generated are seeding uh, the process to be amplified through simulated Raman scattering. And then uh, other simulation again, where we look at uh, basically the uh, population in LP01, LP02, and LP03 for the redshift beam that we call the MDSS. We see that the beams is coupled to LP0N family, which are well concentric beam, while the pump part energy rapidly it doesn't go in the LP01, LP02, LP03, but even in the higher modes. And this explains why when we look at the spatial profile of the beam at 800, we see higher order modes, while when we look at the MDSS, and experimentally, we see it also very clean beam profile at the output of the hollow fiber. So yesterday when I was preparing my talk, I thought of an expression, uh, good cup, bad cup, you know? It's like we have the good from the MDSS and we have the bad from the pump in the sense that the pump at the output cannot be used because it's propagating into higher order modes while the MDSS is really good, really clean, and it's, it's like a self-trap beam composed of LP0N modes. And then a big surprise came. So as I told you at the beginning, when we compress with cell-phase modulation, we need these chirp mirrors to compress. We need to put negative dispersion. But here, I will uh, explain this figure. So uh, the A figure is the Wigner function that we will expect from 1D propagation in the hollow fiber. And you see, you'll have a positive chirp. But when we do MD simulation, where we take into account the multi-dimensional aspect, the pulse has a negative chirp at the output. And experimentally in C, we do see this beautiful negative chirp at the output of the hollow fiber. So by simply taking the output and propagating in a piece of glass by putting positive dispersion, we can compress the pulses from 700 femtosecond to 10.8 femtosecond. This was published in 2020 in Nature Photonics. Uh, sorry, I just realized that I forgot to put the volume and the page, but if you just type the name of Reza Safai or Gwen Ju Fan or my name and Nature Photonics, you will find the paper. So we have a technique that is able to compress sub-picosecond pulses directly to few cycle pulse duration and on top shift the central wavelength towards the infrared. So I believe that such technology will be very appealing and even replacing what I did for the last 10 years, I take my TISAF, I go to an OPA, I take my infrared beam, and then I compress with all of fiber. Now I can just take an ytterbium laser, redshift, generate short pulses in the infrared, and drive high harmonic generation. So I want to make summary of, uh, of the concept. We take a laser pulse, we couple, as it propagates in the beginning of the fiber, 
it couples to uh, higher modes. Uh, it generates new frequencies that are then further amplified by stimulated Raman scattering. And at the output, we have a pulse with a negative chirp that we can compress with a piece of glass. And one thing I can tell you is in our case, we were using TISAF pulses that we had to stretch to mimic a sub-picosecond laser. Whether we put a positive or a negative chirp at the input, we see almost the same pulse shape at the output and the same spectral phase. So how does it work? Basically, the generation of MDSS comes from the balance between diffraction and dispersion, and this balance is made by the spatio-temporal nonlinear enhancement due to uh, the combination of multiple modes in the propagation of the MDSS. In terms of outcome, uh, we can use this technique to compress ecurbium lasers. Uh, this, uh, we have already some preliminary results. And then I believe that this will become a unique driver for high harmonic generation. We have already did it. We can generate harmonics up to 60 EV, and we use these harmonics to do time resolve uh, X-ray spectroscopy, XUV spectroscopy in magnetic material. I can see that my time is running out, so I will stop here. There's a paper accepted in advanced photonics research if you are interested. And I want to thank uh, my team members and past ones, uh, Reza and Fan, uh, Gwenju Fan, uh, Albors, Guillaume, Adrien, Ojun and Catherine and Elisa are still in my group. And then four more group members for the water window, Vincent Cardin, Samuel Beaulieu, Nicolas Tiré, and then all the collaborators uh, since uh, many years of research and thanks to the funding agency and few cycle for the strong collaboration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Francois. It was a beautiful talk, really. And Thank you. Uh, really explanatory. I follow you uh, entirely. So um, let's now is the moment of questions. So uh, please uh, activate your video and your, your microphone and say it out loud, which is the best. But since it always takes a kind of some minutes, I have a question, of course. I mean, uh, and um, basically, I'm, I'm just curious because it's so nice uh, what you just presented. And uh, my first question is out of curiosity is there basically a limited length of such a holocaust fiber that you can uh, use? I mean, which is the maximum length you actually tried? I guess, I mean, out of curiosity, you would try, I mean, I don't know, to pull it into a corridor, I would just make it. Uh, okay, I can tell you. So for the yeah. cell phase modulation, I think once Bruno tried in a corridor at INRS, it was almost 10 or 12 meters of length, okay? Uh, of course, we don't have access every day to 12 meter of length. The experiment was like performed bearing the beam on the soil, in the corridor, over a night between Friday evening and Saturday morning. So yeah, I believe with these very, these uh, flexible fiber, we can go to 10 meters long. In the case of the Raman, uh, initially we were biased by the SPM. We thought it would be better to use a long fiber. So we were using three meter long. I think this is what is published in the Nature Photonics. Maybe two meters, I don't remember exactly, two or three. Now we can see we can use one meter and, okay. and, and simply compensate with pressure. So instead of putting a two or three bar with a three meter long, we go to one meter long with 10 bars and we can achieve the same. So uh, in the case of cell phase modulation, it's very beneficial to go to very long length because uh, when you want to push the broadening, you are always at the limit of tunnel ionization. And ionization in the hollow fiber is very detrimental for SPM. While for the Raman, because we work with very long pulses, we are far from the regime of ionization. And so we can really just increase the pressure and shorten the length. I see. 
I have also another question about keys. I mean, if anybody of the audience can also write in the chat. Uh, so I'm actually looking at the chat. So please come forward. Yeah, I will um, uh, if anyone has a question, I can from the chat or. Yeah, exactly. So another question is, did you ever try to, I don't know if this makes any difference to, let's say, modulate the pressure inside the fiber? Does it actually make any impact? Did you try to have uh, different? You, you said to modulate the pressure? Yes, in the sense that not to have a uniform pressure inside the entire fiber, but have basically different inlet, which allows you to have, let's say, an engineered okay. degree of gradient of pressure. Uh, or... OK. What I can tell you, we never did it in this. I mean, to, to modulate would be a lot of engineering. So exactly. Uh, what we are doing often is a gradient where we put vacuum at input, pressure at output. And even in my group, it's a debate whether this is useful or not. Me, I argue that is useful because any nonlinear effect on the beam before coupling with the input will lead to loss. So I tend to believe, at least, uh, of course, if you use xenon or krypton, you don't want to pump. But with argon or nitrogen, you don't mind to put 10 bars of pressure on one side and zero pressure on the other side and pumping. So I tend to think that pumping is really good. If I will have the resource to do it, what I will do, I'll put my hollow fiber and I will bring the gas from the center and pump from both sides. Because I do see, and I've seen it already in 20, 2002 when I was a PhD student, when the beam comes out at the output of the hollow fiber, because there's a high pressure of gas, you can see that this makes some turbulence in the beam. It makes the beam kind of uh, shaking, you know? Yeah. So I believe if we will go directly to vacuum, uh, it will have it will have basically we will have the hollow fiber that will do the broadening, and then the spatial filter, the cleaning of the beam at the output. And I believe this will end uh, end up in a better beam to drive high harmonic generation. I think Thank there's you. a question. Yes, indeed. Hi, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I hear. Hi. Thanks for the results. Uh, I was wondering what, what is the effect of the initial chirp and what's the difference of using directly a narrower bandwidth pulse? This is an excellent question. So when we did this experiment, unfortunately, we didn't have access to any terbium laser, so we had no other choice than stretching. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is uh, there's not so much difference in terms of broadening uh, I mean, we have results now with seven millijoule, one kilohertz ytterbium. Mm -hmm. But we do see that when we start with a narrow band, uh, it's much more stable at the output. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I believe that the reason for this is when the MDSS are generated, they are generated to the generation of new frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so when the pulse is broadband already, these new frequencies that are generated can interfere, yes, whether yes. constructively or destructively, mm -hmm. with the color already in the laser pulse. While in the case of an ytterbium laser, it's so narrow band that these new colors cannot interfere with anything else. Mm -hmm. They are nicely generated and then amplified through the stimulated Raman scattering. So I believe the main difference is in uh, shot to shot stability. Okay, yeah, I can imagine because we have less bandwidth, so it's a uh, exactly. cleaner exactly. production so of the new frequency. Like, there's less there's less pathways that can interfere. Mm -hmm. Let's put it this way. Okay. Yeah, also the fact that you're using the same peak power even if you chirp is uh exactly keep the physics very similar. So uh, exactly the physics yeah. is similar, but of course there's a bit of addition of uh, of noise, I would mm -hmm. say, when you start with a broadband laser. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So any other question? So if not, I would like- Thanks a lot. Thank you again. 
And uh, Laura, since we yes. have not met for a long time, congratulations for your new position. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. So Bye. Thank you so much. And let's continue with the second speaker of today. So um, allow me to say your name, I, so I hope correctly, uh, Vyacheslav Lyshenko. I hope I did it somehow. <laughs> Sorry, it was not. Uh, yeah, it's so, it's just correct, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so uh, he's going to present us pace result transient absorption HCV spectroscopy of argon. And looking forward for your talk. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, and we. Um, Vyacheslav, I, I, I cannot hear you because you mute yourself. Second. Uh, Zoom somehow crashed. Okay, no problem. So you are back now. Okay, I see your presentation. Okay, yeah. Do you see it now and hear me? Yes. Not okay, okay yeah. perfect. Now we are okay. Okay, sorry. No problem. Um, yeah, thank you for introduction. And uh, one of the motivation for this work is to get access to a full temporal dipole response of a strongly driven media, and in general to get, get more understanding about um, uh, electron wave packet dynamics in some complex cases. And um, here is the outline of my talk. I will first give a quick introduction on. Why do we care about measuring phase at all? And then I will show how one could measure phase in experiments. And um, I will show an example on the measurement of uh, argon out ionization resonances. Yeah, and here you can see a scheme of a standard uh, transient absorption experiment. So uh, in the beginning, we split a beam into two parts and use pa one part of this beam to drive high harmonics. And when you focus uh, XUV uh, beam on a sample and the residual of the infrared beam, we delay and also focus on the same sample and uh, at the end measure XUV spectrum with a spectrometer. And if there is only one XUV beam, it excites um, the medium and uh, induces polarization, uh, which is then decaying with time. And in the Fourier domain, we get uh, absorption spectrum. Um, and if we now introduce a second pulse, which is in this example an infrared pulse, this pulse perturbs uh, uh, dynamics and this time dependent perturb polarization reflects in the change in the absorption spectrum. And in a standard experiment, uh, one measures um, dependence of the absorption spectrum on the delay between these pulses. And by this, can study uh, dynamics of uh, excited states, at least to some extent. Uh, and from a uh, uh, relatively simple mathematical point of view, so if you look into uh, Maxwell's wave equation, we have here polarization, which in a simple linear case could be expressed as a, an ensemble of uh, uh, atomic dipoles. And if you now use this polarization and solve Maxwell's equation, we get an electric field after the sample, which acquires phase proportional to the real, uh, real part of a dipole and absorbance determined by the imaginary part of a uh, dipole. And in the experiment, what I have in the scheme shown in the previous slide, one can measure only absorbance. So it's possible to get access only to the imaginary part of a dipole while real path is not generally speaking accessible in these experiments. Uh, however, one could kind of argue that there is a Kramer's chronic relation which links real and imaginary part of uh, refractive index and corresponding polarization. But the problem is it's, uh, it has a limited applicability, so it fails for in a number of cases because it derived under certain assumptions 
One assumption is a linear medium response, so it f generally fails for nonlinear optics. However, is a modification valid uh, for nonlinear case. And if you're interested, you could have a look at, uh, in this book. And which is more important for this talk, it's also uh, uh, fails in general for in pump probe experiments because one of the basic like fundamental principles uh, which this uh, relation is based on is causality and from the probe point of view uh, pump kind of breaks causality uh, in these experiments uh, and this is also nicely shown in uh, like long time ago in this for example in this PRA paper uh, using optical uh, domain experiment and uh, also as we discussed in the newspaper but it's still a few uh, simplified cases when uh, Kramer's chronic relation or some similar simple relations uh, work but in general case uh, it's always advantageous to get direct access to uh, phase and the real part of a dipole response and therefore yeah it would be nice to measure it and uh, one of the uh, and of obvious way to access the phase information would be to do some interferometry. Uh, in a naive case, one could assume to do some, uh, just build my a Mark Zender interferometer and measure interference. Uh, but this would not work because uh, there are very no good beam splitters for XV radiation, and the scheme on top couldn't be practically realized. And a good way around this problem would be to use uh, two focus interferometry so generate a xuv beam high harmonic beam uh, with uh, two sources or two foci so that on the sample we would have uh, two beams uh, which are separated and we dress only one of them uh, while on the way to detect uh, these beams would they watch and overlap and we uh, could see interference between them and extract phase information. Actually, this uh, general idea was introduced uh, uh, very long time ago. Uh, for example, yeah, uh, you can see, have a look in this paper. The main problem was to find a good and simple, nice way to generate these uh, two foci beams. And in the beginning, we have this well, quite bulky and complicated schemes with many peripheral materials or some uh, interferometers or whatever. Uh, more recently, this idea was revived with a, in a more uh, elegant way and used for high harmonic spectroscopy, as shown in this uh, uh, schematic. And the key idea was to use a simple single step uh, zero pi phase mask to generate a, uh, a double focus beam and this scheme was used for two source high harmonic spectroscopy and essentially as you will see uh, in the following we improve the scheme uh, by adapting it to transient absorption experiments and by replacing the phase mask with a phase grating which gives a larger separation between the foci and uh, makes experiments more reliable and easy to realize. Uh, but we still keep this grating uh, relatively simple, it's just a simple zero pi binary phase grating, uh, which, which is relatively cheap, but it still works quite nicely. So there is a relatively high efficiency uh, of 80% in some of uh, plus and minus uh, first diffraction orders and also nicely uh, there is almost no parasitic radiation in the nearby orders so the signal is pretty clean uh, and on the right you can see the overall scheme of the experimental setup so we start from the OPA uh, output uh, around 13-15 nanometers when we generate a double foci infrared radiation with a phase grating and a lens and when drive high harmonics uh, using a pulsed uh, nozzle back with argon in the experiments which will be shown and refocus 6v beam with an ellipsoid and a gas cell and introduce a infrared dressing beam with a whole mirror and overlap it with only one of the um, xv foci on the sample and it might measure the 
uh, spectrum of X UV radiation. And here you can see a typical image from the detector. So in the X dimension, we have a, a frequency resolution. And in the Y, you can see this interference, uh, which gives us uh, phase information. Yeah, and this experiment step was used to study uh, outer ionization states uh, or the resonances in argon. Uh, so these resonances are uh, caused by the interference between the two pathways. This is uh, direct photoionization uh, and uh, excitation of the of a bound state embedded in the continuum, as shown in this plot on the right. And as a result of this interference, uh, we get a uh, argon has uh, these final resonances uh, corresponding to different p states uh, from and they are mostly interested in this work on the 4p resonance uh, therefore harmonic spectrum and uh, and the opa used to drive harmonics is adjusted to center one of our harmonics at the 4p resonance and the nearby harmonics uh, this happens to be centered around uh, 6p uh, resonance. And if you look on the relevant level structure of argon, which is uh, place, uh, which is a point of this experiment, so we have a bright state of 4p bright state as well as a 6p bright state, which which are excited, and uh, infrared radiation will almost evidently couple 4p state to at least 3D and 5S dark states. And the coupling, as I said, is almost resonant because the energy spacing is uh, close to the photon energy of uh, infrared radiation. And yeah, here you can see a typical uh, data which we get in this uh, setup. So on, on top line, it's a delay scan. On the bottom, it is a intensity, infrared intensity scan at the overlap. And the left is optical density in logarithmic scale. Um, so it's change in absorbance. Red line, uh, red means uh, stronger, like increased absor absorbance when we introduce infrared radiation. Blue is reduced absorbance. And positive delay is XUV uh, comes first. Yeah, and for on the right is, a f is you can see phase, which is a uh, phase difference between uh, infrared on and in front of cases. Yeah, as you can as you can see, as we come closer to the overlap, the absorbance is increasing, and the phase is also evolving in a less trivial way, which is more clearly visible in the intensity scan. So as we increase intensity, uh, we see a stronger absorbance, but the line shapes stay about the same, while phase is actually changing in a uh, quite non-trivial way. So in the beginning, there is a almost one peak in the phase distribution, which broadens and then splits into two uh, peaks. Uh, yeah, just a, 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 a short comment. So this uh, kind of uh, empty areas are actually areas between harmonics where we, in this experiment, and have uh, data because we derive harmonics from relatively long pulses and where uh, we don't cover the entire uh, spectral range. However, one can still could uh, scan wavelength and uh, cover these areas, as shown in this uh, example on the bottom. And yeah, you can see here, for example, this appearance of uh, light induced states around 27.5 AV. And now, as we have uh, both phase and uh, uh, Absorbance, uh, we could uh, compare direct measurement of a phase with uh, Kramer's clinic reconstruction based on the absorbance. Uh, and here in blue, you can see the phase measurements directly from experiments, and orange is a Kramer's clinic reconstruction. And you can see that at low intensity, Kramer's clinic works well, while at high intensities, which means above one terawatt, this example at two terawatts, uh, very so almost no agreement and Kramer's chronic fails completely, which is in principle expected as I discussed in the beginning. And now as we have this both phase and absorbance, uh, we could 
re reconstruct the full dipole response in the frequency domain, as I have shown in the beginning in the ex expressions. And do Fourier transform, I get a dipole in the time domain, uh, which is shown here in blue. And here you can see two examples for low intensity case and high intensity case on the right. And we could also now compare it to the uh, optical density line out from the delay scan, which is shown on the orange, which also uh, represents the polarization lifetime and the dynamics of the induced polarization. And you can see that there is a fairly good agreement between uh, uh, both results, which essentially means that uh, we could reconstruct the full time dependent dipole from a single spectra, or actually from a two spectra pump on, pump off, uh, uh, if you measure it at the pulse overlap. And this could be useful for some experiments where uh, a single shot uh, measurement is uh, required. Yeah, and if now I go back to intensity scan, actually we could easily change polarization for the infrared radiation. And uh, the result is uh, actually quite different if you uh, change uh, infrared radiation to orthogonal case. Uh, so when infrared is orthogonal to XU polarization, so in this case, phase is changing quite significantly while absorbance uh, doesn't change uh, dramatically. And this is in general expected because the dipole selection rules are changing uh, for these cases in the parallel case, uh, if we quantize along the common polarization, the selection rules would uh, set delta m to be zero, while for orthogonal case, it must be plus minus one. Wherefore, we start from ground state at, at m zero, when xuv excites for p with also m zero. And in, a, in the case of orthogonal polarizations, uh, there should be no coupling, no, no direct coupling between the 4P and 5S state just due to uh, selection rules because 5S has only M0. And so any difference between these two cases should correspond to the direct coupling to the 5S state. Therefore, uh, we could assign this uh, upper part of this phase curve to a direct coupling to 5S state. And the, therefore, the lower part is most probably corresponding to a direct coupling to a 3D state, at least at low intensity and at high intensity, it could be something a bit more complicated. So it, it, this is still a work in progress and we are still working on simulation, simulation of these results and uh, just to maybe in the sake of time, I will switch to conclusions. Uh, so I this also, uh, Absorption spectroscopy could be useful for uh, reconstructing of uh, coupling between uh, multiple uh, states. And also, uh, it seems to be promising for a single shot reconstruction of a full temporal dipole response. And uh, I want to help all my colleagues, Sean and Wright, uh, finding agencies, and you for your attention. And uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, uh, So we are open for question for the uh, very interesting and impressive uh, uh, reconstruction, which I'm still uh, looking at this and a bit puzzled uh, what I'm looking at, uh, or try to understand something of it because it's, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, maybe the first time I see actually that you are recording basically the phase of the, uh, of the money that you are. Uh, measuring by a DC interference uh, uh, measurement. This is, uh, wow, it's really interesting. So open for question. Uh, please, uh, as I said before, uh, write or uh, rise uh, and uh, zoom hand, um, just open your video. Um, um, so in while the, the people actually is uh, a little bit, uh, try to pull together a question. Uh, can I ask you to come back to the, to the slide where you first introduced uh, uh, no, back. Uh, we Exactly the first one. Okay, here. Uh, 
Can you guide me again uh, a little bit? Uh, what am I looking on the right? <laughs> because I was uh, kind of very fast. And uh, yeah, this is a phase uh, a difference between uh, pump on pump off cases. Let me look on the intensity scan. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So this uh, 26.6 is a position of uh, 4p resonance. Okay. okay. Here, here is the 6p resonance. So we could look on the maybe face around the 4p resonance. So here on the left, you see the, uh, the peak in the, in the absorbance, mm -hmm. which is corresponding okay. to this uh, 4p uh, resonance state. And then if you look on the face around this, uh, this peak, then it's also uh, evolving in a more kind of non-trivial way. Exactly. So, yeah, in the beginning, it just appearing and broadening, but when at starting from around one terawatt of internet intensity, it starts splitting. Splitting. Uh, and yeah, and we see these two uh, two peaks essentially. Um, maybe it went even like three peaks at high intensity. So the yeah the first point that this uh, this this actual phases uh, is uh, not directly expected and not very trivial uh, in general. And yeah. Yeah, and so it's not a kind of couldn't be reconstructed from the Kramer's chronic relation or from some simple, just directly from the absorbance. Uh, and yeah, and we believe this could be used to uh, study or to the, to use it to and to get better understanding of a coupling between multiple states because this four P state could be coupled as I have shown like here could be coupled to either three D or five S, mm -hmm. and we believe this phase could be used to deconvolute the strength of a bit of between this coupling and uh, dynamics of uh, coupling to multiple states. Uh, so you really need, uh, I mean, this is, becomes uh, uh, fundamental to have a simulation support in order to understand this. Coupling. Yeah, sure. We are, we are working with uh, Luca Argenti, yeah. but uh, uh, it's still okay. not where this is where I am. Uh, Okay, so you're. But this okay. one is just experimental work, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, it's a really beautiful. So we have a question. In the Maxwell equation, you consider the macroscopic polarization as a product of the target density and the microscopic dipole. Doesn't the microscopic dipole depend on position, for instance, due to the field behavior in the transit plane? Does this affect in some way um, affect your reconstruction? Uh, you can also read it again if you need it. Yeah, I see. If you open it. Yeah, but then still, uh, this is a long question. Uh, yeah, in this case, we essentially, yeah, I think it's a general case of macroscopic effects. So we actually do check that uh, we don't have a, a significant contribution from macroscopic effects. So we uh, change pressure. And if we reduce pressure, we, we see that we still measure almost the same result. So we take care that we don't introduce uh, microscopic effects during propagation in the gas. Uh, in terms of uh, spatial beam profile, uh, yeah, there is of course a certain kind of averaging of uh, across the beam profile. So yeah, this is, uh, so intensity is essentially, it's relevant to uh, intensity like average or across the, the profile. Uh, and intensity is, low enough so that it doesn't kind of introduce some kind of very fancy effects like self focus, you know, whatever and for infrared beam. Um, but again, so yeah, we, we do change pressure in the sample and we take care that we are not uh, destroy signal with uh, microscopic effects. Yep. Okay, so we in the sake of time, I would say that uh, uh, the question section for this talk is finished, and I will move for the last uh, for this uh, first afternoon part session. Uh, thank again uh, to Vishesla, <laughs> and uh, now I would like to introduce Debo uh, uh, who is actually presenting us uh, asymmetric electron rescattering in strong field ionization of chiral molecules. The floor is yours. Thank you.
I hope you see my presentation. Yes, we <clears throat> see it. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Yeah, so I am going to present uh, you the results of uh, a collaborative experiment uh, between Celia in Borto and Weissman Institute of Science in Israel. Uh, it's titled uh, Asymmetric Electron Rescattering in Strong Field Ionization of Chiral Molecules. Uh, so uh, the geometric property due to which, uh, what, is chiral, uh, what are chiral molecules? It's a, uh, it's a geometric chirality is basically a geometric property due to which the mirror images of an object, example, the palm of our hands, they can't be superimposed or superposed onto each other. This is called chirality. This uh, geometric property also exists in molecules and uh, they are called enantiomers. They can be left-handed or right-handed. Now, studying these chiral molecules are of great importance as many biological processes are sensitive to the chiral nature of the molecules, especially in pharmacology. Therefore, we should uh, be able to know how to differentiate uh, the two enantiomers. One way, uh, there are a number of ways to differentiate them, uh, is to use circularly polarized light and various other uh, weak uh, magneto uh, uh, chiral optical processes, which are generally weak. But there is another uh, chiral process called photoelectron circular dichroism, which we will be used which we will use to study. Now in uh, photoelectron chiral uh, circular dichroism, we, uh, we use randomly oriented chiral molecules with circularly polarized light. The, uh, and we impinge this circularly polarized light on this randomly oriented chiral molecules and we, and we ionize these chiral molecules. This leads to a forward backward uh, uh, asymmetric emission of electrons relative to the direction of propagation of the laser. And this asymmetric uh, emission of electrons depends on the handedness of the molecule as well as the handedness of the uh, light that is uh, impinged on the molecule. Hence, uh, PCD or photoelectron circular dichroism is characterized by this forward backward asymmetry. And uh, this uh, chiroptical process emerges from the scattering of electrons of the chiral uh, potential and can reach about 30% of the signal. Now, we so far, uh, PCD has been studied in various uh, ionization regimes such as VUB1 photon, 2 plus 1 resonant enhanced multiphoton uh, ionization, uh, and even in strong fields. Uh, in general, PCD uses circularly polarized light and in need, uh, you want uh, as much as circular photons in the experiment to get the highest possible signal. And uh, it, is, uh, it was shown that uh, uh, PCD uh, is linearly scales with uh, the amount of circular photons that is present in the light or in the laser beam. And this amount of circular photons uh, is represented by the third Stokes parameter and it basically gives uh, the percentage of circular photons present in the beam. <clears throat> but it, uh, but uh, this is not necessarily true that it follows a, li a linear uh, 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 behavior with uh, the amount of circular uh, photons uh, present in the beam or the ellipticity of light or the S3, uh, uh, the third Stokes parameter. But it was uh, also shown that in some cases, uh, this uh, dichroic signal can involve non-monotonically with uh, the ellipticity of the light. There is another way uh, to uh, manipulate uh, this structure, uh, this ellipt uh, elliptical dichroism in strong field regime. Uh, many experiments have shown the interest of shaping the electric fields and combining multiple colors and multiple polarizations and they can lead to a uh, very complex polarization states which are useful to study chiroptical optics processes. Now, uh, let us focus on the strong field ionization regime. 
and see what uh, happens to the chiral response in the strong field regime. Before uh, so, this is uh, basically uh, how the Coulomb potential looks like. Uh, and uh, when the molecule is impinged with an uh, electromagnetic radiation, an electron is spawned into the continuum by tunneling out uh, of the molecular potential barrier. Now, on in strong field approximation, we should not see the uh, photoelectron circular dichroism as the molecular potential is neglected. But it has it, ha it was observed that DCD still exists in strong field uh, ionization regime. But why? Why does this uh, exist? This is basically because of the presence of residual chiral potential during the electron scattering in continuum as well as the possible influence of chiral potential internally. Now, uh, the other uh, part uh, of strong field are rescattered electrons. Now, what? Uh, let us take uh, a look at the electron wave packet dynamics involved in rescattering. These uh, tunneled out electrons, uh, they get accelerated in the incident electromagnetic field and their trajectories are dictated at, by the time at which they are released from the molecular potential. These electrons, uh, some of these electrons may directly uh, move towards the detector or where some of the uh, can come uh, can be driven back by the incident uh, laser field and they can rescatter from the molecular potential uh, the the ones that uh, move directly towards the detector are called direct electrons whereas the ones uh, that are driven back uh, towards the laser uh, towards the ion is are called indirect electrons for the direct electrons the maximum energy that they can gain is twice the ponderomotive uh, energy of the electromagnetic field, whereas for uh, the indirect electrons or scattered electrons, they can gain up to uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 UP. Uh, now, since uh, these rescattered electrons uh, come back, are driven back by the laser uh, electromagnetic field, they can recollide with the uh, with the chiral molecular potential, and hence we can uh, this can lead to a higher pcd but there is a problem that uh, there is no rescattering in circularly polarized light because we don't have closed electron trajectories uh, such that they can come back to the and scatter from the molecular potential and also there is no uh, uh, circular dichroism in linearly polarized fields uh, where the where we have the maximum rescattering possible. So to circumvent these problems, uh, we uh, can use bicircular laser fields or a much more synthetic laser fields, uh, as uh, which can in, uh, as we changes uh, subcycle uh, subcycle laser fields. Now, these subcycle shaped laser fields are great, but uh, maybe we don't need them. Maybe we can simply use uh, ellipt elliptically polarized uh, laser fields because even though uh, the most of the electron wave packet is driven uh, back to the uh, molecule, some of it will interact uh, with the chiral potential, and hence maybe we can see uh, some forward backward electron asymmetry in the emission of electrons. Now, so uh, for this ex uh, to realize this, this is uh, we make our experimental setup, uh, and uh, the main salient features of this setup is that we use a 1030 nanometer uh, wavelength laser, uh, one megahertz uh, repetition rate, and hence we can get uh, a huge statistics. The intensities are about uh, two into ten to the power thirteen watt per centimeter square. And uh, the Keldish parameter is in the non-adiabatic -adi tunneling regime. Also, we can get 2D projections from the BMI. And from, uh, from this, we can use uh, tomographic reconstruction to get uh, 3D photoelectron angular distributions. 
So this is what we get as photoelectron angular distributions for circular case and for uh, the linear case. We clearly see that the electrons, uh, we get electrons higher than uh, 2up, hence we uh, do observe uh, electron rescattering and up to 10up. So how do we measure photoelectron circular decreasing? We take uh, the photoelectron uh, angular distributions uh, for uh, for a given polarization or a given helicity of the light. Then we forward backward anti-symmetrize it. Then we subtract it from uh, the uh, the forward backward anti-symmetric image of the other helicity and normalize it. This is how we get uh, the photoelectron circular dichroism signal. Now this is the photoelectron circular dichroism signal for uh, uh, circular case, for circular polarization, and for elliptical polarization. Now uh, we need to normalize this because uh, uh, in circular polarization, 100% of our uh, 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 photons are uh, circularly polarized, whereas uh, in uh, S3 equals 0.2, only 20% uh, of the uh, uh, photons are pol uh, circularly polarized. So we need, in order to get a proper uh, quantity, we need to normalize it with respect to the S3 value, and also, uh, and hence we use this normalization, the PCD by S3, and the PS pixel per pixel, and we see that. Uh, are uh, in circular uh, polarized, uh, polarization case, we get uh, a photoelectron asymmetry of about 4.5%. And for uh, this one, we get about 15% uh, for uh, elliptical, elliptical case. Now, what is the enantial sensitivity of the bead? Now, so uh, like in order to verify that our experiments are good, we need to uh, take a plus function and my, uh, the two handedness uh, molecule that is the left handed molecule and the right handed molecule and to see like if the forward backward asymmetry changes sign because this is an important uh, property of pcd so we uh, do this it does change sign if you see and uh, then we sub in order to remove the artifacts uh, further we can uh, subtract uh, the um, plus function from the minus function and uh, normalize correspondingly. And we get a clean artifactless image. Now here we can see that we do observe uh, rescattered electrons because this is the, if you draw the 2UP circle and the 10UP circle, we do see electrons that are uh, in higher than 2UP, hence they are rescattered or indirect electrons. Now, how does this uh, change? How do uh, this rescattering uh, asymmetry change? Uh, the asymmetry in the rescattered electrons change with the ellipticity. So we uh, here we show uh, S3 equals uh, 0.2, that is 20% of the uh, electron. Uh, photons are circularly polarized, uh, S3 equals 0.7, where 70% are circularly polarized, and S3 equals 1. So we see that the corresponding photoelectron elliptical dichroism is 15% uh, for S3 equals 0.2, 7.5% for 0.7, and for circularly polarized, we have 4.5%. And hence, we can see that uh, the dichroism is also sensitive to the ellipticity. And also a very interesting thing to note is that for 20 per, uh, for S3 equals 0.2 and 4.7, the structure looks almost relatively the same. And uh, if we draw the 2UP circle, it is roughly here, we can see like uh, we still uh, see some rescattering. Now, what is the structural sensitivity of the rescattering field? Like if we change, uh, in order to study that, we, uh, we can change the chiral molecular potential and we can see if this, is, uh, if this process is sensitive to the change in the chiral molecular potential. So we use different uh, molecules 
tension, limonene, alpha pinene, and beta pinene. And uh, here I show you uh, the uh, respective field images for S3 equals 0.2. For, uh, for pension, we see about 15% asymmetry. For uh, limonene, we see uh, a field of about 30%. For uh, alpha pinene, we see about 15%. And for uh, beta pinene, we uh, observe about uh, 10%. It's very interesting to see, uh, note that uh, alpha pinene and beta pinene are isomers of each other, and they look relatively the same. But still, this, uh, this uh, process of measurement is quite sensitive to this even slight changes in the chiral molecular potential. So the main take back messages are that we do observe rescattered electrons which show strong asymmetry up to 15 to 30 percent. A strong dependence of photoelectron asymmetry on the ellipticity of the incident electromagnetic field an appreciable asymmetry is also observed for rescattered electrons, even for small ellipticities. Now, what are the future uh, perspectives of this experiment? It's to see if there is an interference between the direct and the rescattered electrons and study uh, and observe chiral holographic patterns. And also to see if we can further image the molecules using chiral laser induced electron diffraction. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your uh, interesting talk and uh, uh, with this uh, images that I'm still, uh, I was just observing and trying to picture in my mind. Actually, this is my first question until the other will actually warm up a little and uh, at least come out with one question I would actually hope for. Yeah. Um, so I was actually picturing myself how this rescattering is happening uh, while using this elliptical uh, 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 elliptical polarization in such big molecules with the definite chiral uh, behavior. So, could you actually uh, help me in doing this? So, you, since you also try different molecules, and actually, you um, there is a clear sensitivity over the structure of the molecule itself. Can you actually help me in, in picturing how this, uh, I mean, what drives this risk happening with the elliptical uh, light, can, how it can happen, and uh, what drives this? So, uh, this uh, asymmetry is uh, like you want to know what uh, what produces this asymmetry or uh, what? Uh, yeah, how, how... how, I mean, since you, I mean, it's uh, you actually. Uh, one of your main points, strong point, is indeed that you demonstrate that if you have risk scattering in uh, uh, from uh, chiral molecule using uh, elliptical light, and then yeah. I, I would like to, to see how it works. I mean, to be how what this so, so uh, why it can happen. So normally it, like, sh we shouldn't see it. Yeah. So the, uh, the thing is that since these are big molecules. And if uh, when the electron is ejected, uh, ejected using an elliptical path, polarized light, if say mm -hmm. it is uh, going like this, then uh, it will be driven a bit further from the, uh, the this wave packet, a bit further from the uh, the main uh, uh, ionic uh, potential. But it can come back and rescatter from this ionic potential, like even if not completely, but some partially. Mm -hmm. And then it uh, it gains this information. Now, since this potential itself is chiral, so it will gain an information about uh, this potential, these electrons. But the molecules are not lined, so is everything averaged on uh, the overall. So it's do you think would be sensitive on since these are big molecules would be sensitive on uh, so yes on the chiral potential. So yes, of course, it's sensitive where exactly it comes back into the molecules. So this is uh, uh, like, uh, this is a, a chiral property that uh, survives random orientation. So, survives random orientation. Yeah. so even okay. if you uh, use a, like an uh, aligned molecule, you will still see some chiral uh, response. But uh, even if you don't use uh, aligned molecules, even like in our experiment, we use 
randomly oriented molecules like you don't align the molecules mm -hmm. so this uh, property still survives that Yeah, I'm wondering what I would see if we... Okay. Yes? I hope I'm clear. Mm -hmm. No, no, I... Uh, so I'm wondering what if... I mean, if we would align the molecule, what happens? And even if you don't align the molecule, my, uh, my further question would be actually, are you sensitive where the electron comes back? So depending on the trajectory of, so it would yeah, be you, energetic you, sensitive. So at any energy, you end up to a different part of your molecule, to a different. Yeah, yeah you will be sensitive to from where the, uh, from which part of the molecule uh, the electron is scatters from. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's basically if you just change the electricity a tiny bit. So if uh, instead of scatter, okay. scattering from here, it will scatter from this part of the molecular potential. No, no, I get it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, any question, please. <laughs> okay, maybe everybody is calling for a coffee. I have a question. Oh, yes, thank you. Hi. So, yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, in, in the slide that you have right now, uh, do you know? Can you guess or do you have an idea of why the chiral uh, response in limon and much twice? as the chiral response in the other ones. So, uh, like the, the, the circle, the, the, the elliptical dichroism is twice in limon and the, in the other molecules. Do you have an idea of why this is happening? Or? So I'm not very, uh, I cannot say for con uh, confidently, but uh, why, like uh, exactly why uh, it is so sensitive, but uh, experimentally we do observe it. So it can be because of uh, there are some spe uh, specific uh, 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 chiral, uh, the molecular potential is uh, modified in a certain way that it enhances this chirality. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. And do you think these new experiments that you are planning, do you think this will give you more information about it? Um, um, yes, uh, like especially uh, like uh, from here, uh, from the interference between the, from the chiral holographic patterns, we can study like how uh, uh, we can uh, manip since we will be manipulating this uh, electron trajectories in a much more finer way. We can uh, kind of scan the whole chiral molecular potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank and, you. Uh, and also from the laser induced electron diffraction. Thank you. Well, thanks again. It was a really nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, indeed for the talk. And uh, I would say that we actually are a little bit uh, delayed, but still in time for uh, the coffee break. So now it's reduced to 10 minutes. So I would say see you back at uh, 15.40 for the last two talks of today before the first session. So see you. hello, everybody. So yes, this is uh, time for coming back to the last session of today. So actually, I'm start. So, introduce um, this speaker of the last session. So, we have uh, David Aguso, who is presenting us uh, good first optical rotation in chiral molecules. So, we continue with chirality with ultra short and tightly practiced laser process. Give you the floor, David. Thank you for the introduction and trying to my second screen. Uh, hmm. Okay, can you see the slides, right? 
Sorry, can you see my slides? We see your presenter screen. Okay, great, thank you. No, like your notes. Okay, then that's not how it should be. What is? It doesn't let me share my second screen. I don't know why. Um... But you, you, you see the notes, you don't see the, the, the slides. Is this just my problem or I don't hear you actually? What is my problem? So uh, we still see your uh, slides. I mean, we were seeing your slide with your notes. Uh, just... So it's a button to swap uh, this place. If you go back to, to your slide. It's like it, it doesn't let me show my second screen as I, as I usually and do. So. Now we cannot see you speaking. I hear you speaking, sorry. Okay, but now it's the same. You, you, my screen sharing is paused. Why is this paused? So, so I, I just I don't know how to change this. this. I mean, otherwise you can just... Do it like this. Now it's the same. You see my notes. And now the lights are uh, yeah. perfect. Ah, so this place. Now? It was good. <laughs> but it's bad again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did it here. So that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, thank you, Laura, uh, for the introduction and, and thanks again to the organizers for, for giving me the opportunity of presenting our work here. Let me check my pointer. And, and now. Now you see. And just continue. So um, my talk is also about chirality. It's, it's about how we can tailor the polarization of light in order to distinguish between the left-handed version and the right-handed version of a chiral molecule efficiently and on ultra-fast timescales. And um, I want to introduce a new method that we call ultra-fast optical rotation that uses ultra-short and tightly focused laser pulses um, and it encodes the chirality of a medium um, in the polarization on the nonlinear optical response. And I'm going to start by acknowledging the people that have contributed to this work. Uh, first, uh, Olga Smirnova, who has been my postdoc supervisor for five years at the Max Born Institute in Berlin. Andres Ordoñez, uh, he did his PhD with Olga, and then he got a Marie Curie Fellowship to go to ITFO in Barcelona. And we also work with Ms. Ivanov, also from MBI. And we got funding uh, from the Royal Society that supports my fellowship at Imperial and also from the German DFG. And next slide. Okay, I can go through this very quickly after the, the previous uh, presentation. So as uh, the Bobrat explained, something is chiral when it cannot be superimposed to its mirror image. And just like our hands, molecules can be chiral and opposite versions of the same chiral molecule, like the one represented here, have identical physical and chemical properties unless they interact with something that is also chiral. And this is like, it happens with my hands. I can get this glass of water, for instance, with my right hand, my left hand, and it's the same because this glass of water is not chiral. But then if I use this glove, then this glove is going to fit my right hand, but it's not going to fit my left hand. And the exact same principle applies to molecules. And one of the many reasons that chirality is so important is that most biomolecules are chiral. And therefore, for instance, you can have a molecule that is a very effective medicine whose mirror image is poisonous. So being able to distinguish between these opposite molecular antimers is very important. And one way of doing this is using light. We can use light as a tool for chiral recognition. And uh, there are two ways that we can do this. Uh, we can identify the chirality of matter using light, using, using two approaches. The first one is to use light as a chiral reagent. So this means using the chirality of light to probe the chirality of matter, 
like I use the chirality of the glove to probe the chirality of my hands. But there is another option. We can also detect the chirality of molecules without relying on the chirality of light if we analyze vectoral observables. And I'm going to talk a bit first about the this first approach, and then I will move to the second. And the main results that I'm going to present today belong to the second group of approaches. So in this first approach, we rely on the chirality of light to prove the chirality of matter. And traditionally, this has been done using circularly polarized light, which is chiral because it creates a helix in space. And helices are chiral. Uh, but there is, there is a problem here, and is that the pitch of this helix, so the distance between this point and this point, is too large compared to the size of the molecules. So if you let me go back to my analogy, now imagine that this glove is a thousand times bigger. It could still be chiral, but I could not use it to uh, identify the chirality of my hands efficiently. And the same thing happens with molecules. And this uh, results in very weak and anti-sensitive signals, and usually below 0.1%. And we have recently shown that we can bypass this fundamental limitation by using synthetic chiral light, which we introduced in this paper recently. So here, instead of relying on this helical structure in space, we create new optical fields in which the tip of the electric field vector creates a chiral structure in time. So this is the least you figure that the tip of the electric field vector in these synthetic chiral fields creates in time. Now, this Lissage figure has three dimensions and it is chiral. And we can adjust the shape of this Lissage figure to fit any chiral molecule in order to maximize the sensitive response. And we can get the limit of efficiency, which is 100%, which is much larger than, than with uh, standard circularly polarized light. And we have also shown very recently that you can use this type of light. Uh, you can structure this type of chirality in space to realize a chiral version of the young stavros lit experiment. I'm not going to talk about this now, but if you're interested, you can ask me later and you can also read the papers and, and contact me anytime. Now, as I said before, we can also detect the chirality of matter without relying on the chirality of light. Now, PCD, in fact, uh, for the electron circular dichroism uh, and the, the very interesting results that the Bobrata presented just before me belong to this second group of approaches. Because even though they use elliptically polarized light and circularly polarized light, which is chiral, they don't rely on the chirality of the field to generate an antisensitive response. So they don't rely on non electric dipole interactions. And that's why they can get such a strongly antisensitive signals. But I'm going to go back a couple of centuries because this has been known for a very long time that we don't need to rely on the chirality of light to prove the chirality of matter. And traditionally, this has been done using linearly polarized light, which is obviously not chiral, in a method that is called optical rotation. So here we send a linearly polarized wave through a chiral medium, and then the polarization of the wave rotates as it propagates and it rotates in opposite directions, in, in media of opposite chirality. So by measuring this rotation angle, we can know whether our medium is left-handed or right-handed. Now, the total intensity that we measure is not an antisensitive because this field is not chiral, but this is what happens also in PCD, in, in the results that the Bobrata presented, the total number of emitted photoelectrons is not an antisensitive, then antisensitivity appears in the photoelectron angular distributions. This is somewhat similar. The total intensity that reaches the detector is not an antisensitive, but then antisensitivity, antisensitivity appears in the polarization of the wave, in particular in the rotation angle. Now, this method has uh, important limitations because unlike PCD, here, this effect does rely on non-electric dipole interactions, which in general are very weak. And uh, I mean, we can still get large rotation angles in optically dense media, but the single molecule contributions to, the, to this effect is very weak. So uh, detecting the chirality, for instance, of dilute samples or gas phase samples here can be very challenging. And if you want to do ultra fast time resolved spectroscopy, then this is even more challenging. So can we design a more efficient version of this method?
So I'm now going to introduce an alternative version of optical rotation, which is highly nonlinear, unlike traditional optical rotation. It relies purely on electric dipole interactions, also unlike uh, standard optical rotation, and it requires confinement in time and in space. And I'm about to explain what I mean by this. Now, confinement in space means that the spatial region where the field is intense needs to be small, as it happens in a tightly focused beam, for instance. And we need this confinement in space to create forward ellipticity or transverse spin. So we are going to use a field that is linearly polarized along X in this direction, and that it propagates along Y in this direction. And I assume that you can see my mouse. I cannot. Now you should. Oh, yes, now yes. Now let's. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, is the field is polarized along X in this direction. It propagates along Y in this direction. And now, if the beam is very tightly focused, then near the focus, the field acquires a very strong longitudinal component and it becomes elliptically polarized. And uh, we call this forward ellipticity because the minor ellipticity component appears in the direction of light propagation. So it's not like in standard elliptical polarization where the electric field vector is always orthogonal to the propagation direction. Here, one component is longitudinal, and this happens because the beam is tightly focused. Now, if we put randomly oriented chiral molecules here, this field is going to drive a time-dependent polarization in the medium that happens on ultra-fast time scales and that is 3D and chiral. So this is the total polarization in the medium um, that has three orthogonal components. So first we have one component along X, which is in the direction of the main component of the driving field. This component is not sensitive to chirality. We also have polarization along Y, uh, but this component is, is quite irrelevant because it is in the direction of propagation and therefore it does not contribute to the macroscopic signal in the far field. What's important is that because chirality breaks mirror symmetry, we also have polarization along Z in this direction, so orthogonal to the plane of polarization of the field. Now, this component is exclusive of chiral media and it has opposite sign in media of opposite chirality. So we have Px, which is identical in the two enantiomers, and Pz, which is of the same intensity, but out of phase. So now the question is, is the chiral medium going to emit elliptically polarized harmonics with an antiosensitive polarization? Well, in general, unfortunately, no, because the chiral response appears at even harmonic frequencies, and the non-chiral response appears at all harmonic frequencies, so they don't spectrally overlap. Unless, of course, we use a short pulse. And this is what I meant before by confinement in time. So if we have a very short pulse with a broad spectral band within the frequency domain, then the chiral and the non-chiral uh, components of the response overlap in frequency. And now the medium can create elliptically polarized harmonics. And the polarization of these harmonics can be strongly antisensitive. And as you know, something that is very important when we have a very short pulse uh, is the carrier envelope phase. So the phase between the carrier and the envelope, because this carrier envelope phase determines the shape of the wave and also, therefore, the nonlinear response of matter. And now I'm going to show you that by controlling this, this carrier envelope phase, the CEP, we can efficiently control the nonlinear response of chiral molecules with extremely high enantiosensitivity. So we have done uh, numerical simulations for randomly oriented propylene oxide, which is this chiral molecule here. And we use these laser parameters, and this is the ellipticity of the harmonic light emitted at a given position in the far field as a function of the harmonic number and as a function of the carrier envelope phase. So red means that for this harmonic, for this CP, we get positive uh, ellipticity, blue means negative ellipticity, and white means linear polarization. Now, as you can see, we get very high values of ellipticity. Uh, this happens because uh, this effect is very strong. It happens due to purely electric dipole interactions, and it happens already at the single molecule response, and it can also be observed in the macroscopic response of the medium.
And this effect is very sensitive to the CEP, as you can see. So if you go, for instance, from here to here, then you change the CEP by pi, and then you change the sign of ellipticity. And these ellipticities record the chirality of the medium, because this is what we get in the left-handed molecule in this one. This is what we get in the right-handed molecule. We get exactly the opposite result. So negative ellipticities become positive, positive ellipticities become negative. So by measuring the ellipticity of these harmonics, we can identify and quantify the chirality of the medium efficiently. And I sort of promise an anti-sensitive rotation because this method is actually called ultra-fast optical rotation. So what is this rotation? Well, as you know, when we uh, create elliptically polarized harmonics, the polarization ellipses of the harmonics can be rotated. So let's have a look. Now, this is the rotation angle of the major component of the polarization ellipse of the harmonics. So here we have results again for the left-handed molecule. Red means positive rotation, blue means negative rotation, and white means no rotation, again, as a function of the harmonic number or as a function of the CEP. So just to be clear, no rotation means that the main axis of the polarization ellipse of the harmonic, so this is the polarization of the harmonic, the main axis is parallel to the polarization of the driving field, which is here in green. And this is what we find here for harmonic five. Now, positive rotation means that the ellipse is rotated in this direction, and this is what happens here in this region. And negative rotation means that the ellipse is rotated in the opposite direction, and this is what happens in this region. And this is what we get for the left-handed molecule. Now, since this is a purely an antisensitive response, you can already guess what we, what we are going to find in the right-handed molecule. We get exactly the opposite result. So positive rotation, here becomes negative here, and negative rotation here becomes positive here. And let me emphasize that these are very large values. We get values of 50 degrees and more, and these values can be measured in broad spectral regions. And again, these values are big. This happens already at the single molecule response, and it can be observed in the macroscopic response of the medium. And what's important also is that by controlling the, the CP of the field, we can get full control over this antisensitive response. And this is the last slide. I'm going to go quickly. Just uh, want to say that we can turn this highly antisensitive polarization into highly antisensitive intensity by placing a polarizer before the detector. So if you put a polarizer, uh, you project the chiral and non chiral components uh, of the harmonics into the same axis and they interfere. And you can quantify uh, this in antisensitivity using a standard definition of chiral dichroism. So this is the difference between the intensity that you record in the left-handed molecules minus what you record in the right-handed molecules divided by the average. So this is chiral dichroism. It's represented here, again, function as a function of harmonic number and CEP. And you can see that in very large regions, you can get here, for instance, you will record a lot of intensity from the left-handed molecule and nothing from the right-handed molecule, and here in the blue region is the opposite. So let me summarize very quickly because I think I'm out of time. Uh, we have introduced a new method for highly efficient chiral discrimination, which we call ultra-fast optical rotation. It requires confinement in time and in space of the driving field. And what's interesting also is that this confinement also happens in, in hollow core fibers, but I think you will need to use smaller diameters than the one that Francois Le Carré used in the result that he presented today. But this, is also, this also creates new opportunities for efficient uh, chiral recognition. Here we get strongly antisensitive uh, response in the polarization of the emitter harmonics in the ellipticity and in the rotation angle. It can be turned into intensity with a polarizer. And this effect was important is that it's driven by purely electric dipole interaction. And this creates new opportunities for ultra-fast imaging and control of chiral molecules with high energy sensitivity. And with this, I finish. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Javier, for your very nice talk and uh, to enlighten me about chirality. And it's, uh, it's for me a bit lost before, <laughs> but uh, with the globes, I understood everything. And <laughs> so, um, waiting uh, for questions. I hope uh, people after the coffee restored and actually uh, managed to have questions.
questions or uh, you can spend time to uh, build up a question about your own talk. So um, in the meanwhile, um, I was actually uh, wondering that uh, you mentioned uh, confinement in time and in space. There are some specific limitation about this, which is that, let's say, the uh, maximum time and space that you can actually allow for this to happen? Or are there so, can you quantify this? Yeah. So it depends on the wavelength. So here we use uh, 800 nanometers. So that's, and then the pulse duration, we use seven femtoseconds. What's important is that you have a very short pulse. Uh, actually, there is this figure. Let me try to go back to the figure. So yeah, you need to have something like this. So a very short pulse. Mm -hmm. So how long? It depends on the wavelength, like for- uh, Exactly, if you go away from the 800 nanometer, for example then you should scale this as well in a, in, a, in a way that you only have a few cycles. You, you need to have only a few cycles because if you have a longer pulse, then what happens is that you have all harmonics and even harmonics that are yeah, yeah. well-defined and you need this overlap. So you need something like this that it has uh, like two, three cycles, a few, a few cycle pulse. I see. It's really interesting. So okay. questions, please. Um, so, for example, um, in uh, in the plot that you already uh, did, you use a uh, uh, perhaps I missed it. But um, in which molecules did you really try uh, to perform some simulation? So, did you, the the which are the molecules that perhaps you already investigated or? We, I present the result for propylene oxide. We have simulations in other molecules in fenchon, uh, in H2O2, which is also chiral sort of artificially because in nature you have the two enantiomers. I mean, I mean, what we have seen that is actually not surprising is that these effects uh, are present in any chiral molecule because it's this based on very general symmetry considerations. Mm -hmm. So that this happens in every chiral molecule. What's also interesting is that the, the specific features are molecule specific. Uh huh. So, okay. Yeah. So these all these features that you can see here, all the, the, this changes completely when you change the chiral molecule, which is interesting because it, it reflects the, the the chirality of the molecular potential, and, and this is different for for different molecule. I see. This is actually really interesting. Um, uh, all the molecules, of course, are in gas phase. Uh, yes, you tried, right? We, yeah, well, in, in the simulations, we assume an isolated molecule. Uh, if you do this experiment, uh, you could do it um, because this effect is sensitive to the CEP. So if you try to do it like in a, in a, in a thick, uh, optically dense medium, then the CEP is going to change and you may kill the antisensitive response. But for instance, in a liquid uh, microjet, you know, in a flat liquid microjet, it should work as well because it's sufficiently thin, so the CEP is constant uh, in the interaction region. Yeah, that's actually very interesting. <laughs> so, liquid microjet is probably the best way of doing this experiment because also the we you need to create this forward ellipticity to get this chiral exactly. Response. Now, here we create this forward ellipticity by making the the beam very very tight, but this also means that the volume where you have a field that is sufficiently intense with forward electricity is smaller so then liquid microjet is, is perfect in in the gas phase it may be harder because you may not have enough density of molecules exactly so liquid microjet is in the gas phase i mean you could also create forward electricity with a non-collinear setup and then it's a different setup but you can get equivalent result and then you do not, not need to be so tight thank you so much Thank you. So, um, congratulations on, on your position, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, if there are no questions, so we can proceed to our last speaker. Thanks again, David, for your beautiful talk. And uh, we conclude.
with the uh, Taoyang Guo. Did I Hello. pronounce correctly your name? I hope yeah, Zhao so. Hong. Yeah, yes. Thanks so much. So um, we start a little bit, uh, 10 minutes later, but I hope this is still fine for everybody. And uh, Taoyang is going to present development of two color sub femtosecond pump probe techniques with the Israeli free electron lasers. Looking forward to hear your talk. And here Thank you so much. is your floor. Yeah. Please. Can, I, can I start to share my screen? Absolutely. OK. Hello, everyone. Can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Yes. OK. I see your screen. Presentation. Okay. Thanks for Laura's introduction. So my talk today is about the development of two color sub femtosecond pump probe techniques with X-ray free electron laser. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge our X-Leap collaboration. So the X-Leap stands for X-ray laser enhanced attosecond pulse generation project uh, LCLS and LCLS2. So our collaborators members come from SLIDE Agro National Lab, LMU in German and Imperial College of London. The Edison campaign led by James Cryan, Peter Water, and Agostini Marinati in SLIDE aims to perform real-time observation of ultra-fast electron motion using attosecond x leap pulses. Our research is candidly supported by, uh, supported by the Department of Energy of the United States. So here's my outline. So first of all, I will give an introduction to X-ray free electron laser. I will talk about the main properties of FEO, the micro-bunching FEO, and the challenges in uh, generating attosecond soft X-ray FEL pulses. Then I will talk about how we overcome the limit and generate soft X-ray attosecond pulses in the X-ray project. I will talk about how to generate single attosecond pulses and two colors attosecond pump row pulse pairs. So after that, I will talk about how to diagnose attosecond FEL pulses by angular streaking. In the last part, I will talk about our attosecond campaign experiment, which uses attosecond pump row pulse pairs to do real-time observation of ultra-fast electron motions. An FEL is a fourth generation light source producing extremely bright and short pulses of radiation. An FEL employs relativistic electrons as a gain medium. High brightness, high energy electron beam from a linear accelerator can drive a high gain X-ray FEL amplifier in a long angulator. The gain can be so high that the initially incoherent angulator radiation evolves to an intense quasi-coherent field known in the self-amplified spontaneous emission process, which is called SASI. So XFEL share properties of many conventional ultrafast lasers. Its power can be up to hundreds of gigawatt. The pulse length is usually sub hundreds of femtosecond. The narrow bandwidth is usually around maybe 0.1%, can be further shortening down to 0.005% through self city and it's almost transversely coherent. The fundamental resonance wavelength of the FEL is given by the equation shown on the top right. Here, the lambda U is the per period of the magnetic chicane, gamma is the Lorentz factor of the electron beam, and the K is the normalized magnetic field in the angulator. So basically, the electromagnetic field wave in the forward direction co-propagates with the electron beam, and may it change inter and may it interchange uh, uh, energy with the electron beam. In the free space, the interaction cannot be sustained because the EM wave is always faster than the speed of, uh, than the speed of an electron. In the angulator, since the en electron beam goes through a vagrant motion, the co-propagating radiation overtakes the electron in one angulator period by one lambda FEL. In this case, due to the periodicity of the system, the interaction with the plan EM wave carry the resonance wavelength can be sustained. The figure shown on the bottom left shows the peak brightness of selected FEL and synchrotron facilities all over the world. The FELs, are up to 10 order of magnitude brighter than synchrotron radiations. The 10 order of magnitude enhancement in brightness mainly comes from three advantages of FEL. The first one is the good transverse coherence, the second one is the short temporal or pulse length, and the third one is the local longitudinal phase, uh, phase coherence. The figure shown on the bottom right shows the gain length measurement in the LCS lasing campaign. The FEL power was saturated at the end of the 18th angulator. The saturated power of the 1.5 angstrom 8 keV FEL pulse is around 10 GeV. Okay. The key idea of FEL is all about micropunching. The radiation generated by electron beam itself in the angulator can interact with the electron beam itself and cause the electron beam to reorganize itself into a sequence of micropunches separated by the radiation wavelengths. 
which results in the coherence emission of X-ray radiation with a peak power, many orders of magnitude larger than the spontaneous emission. Here I show a video uh, of the FEL simulation made by Swan Reich. The electron beam starts from a relatively uniform spatial distribution. Depending on the relative phase of the electrons to the plane wave, some electrons gain energy from the radiation, other electrons lose energy to the radiation. Hence, the energy of a long, long electron beam is periodically modulated at FEL resonance wavelengths. The energy of an electron is related to its speed, right? A, a faster electron catches up with slower electron. A periodic density modulation and radiation wavelengths begins to be built up in the angulator. Under favorable condition, the microbunch of the electron beam can emit coherent radiation, and the EM wave can gain net energy, and the FEL amplifier occurs. OK, now this is the question. Why is it so hard to directly generate at a second soft, soft X-ray FBL pulses? The temporal pulse length of the shortest achievable FBL pulses is limited available bandwidth, which is usually on the order of 0.1% for an FBL without self cd For hard X-ray, that's good. The XFEL bandwidth at LCS can support a single spike pulse shorter than one femtosecond. The figure A shown on the left-hand side shows 10 shots of measured spectrum at 5.6 keV. The average of four watts high maximum bandwidth is like 11 EV, which indicates that 160 out of seven pulse lengths in the Fourier transform limit case. However, energy of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen K edges are all below one keV, where 0.1% bandwidth is not poor enough to support atosecond, uh, atosecond pulse generation. So far, the bandwidth of the shortest XFEL pulses generated without X lead is around one EV. My benchmark FBL simulation shows that temporal length is about two to three femtoseconds. To overcome the bandwidth limitation of the soft X-ray FBL pulses, we compress the electron beam with a high power infrared pulse to make a high current spike with a short. Sure. The technique is called enhanced self-amplified spontaneous emission, ESASI. Okay, here's a, here's a schematics on how we do ESASI. Uh, the key idea, uh, how we do X-ray projects with ESASI. From figure A1 to A3, ESASI compression takes an initially unmodulated electron beam, applies an energy modulation to it, and then use the magnetic chicken compressor to turn the energy modulation into a high current spike with a large energy charge. The energy modulation in the wiggler can be driven by an externally injected laser or by self-modulation from the radiation emitted by the beam itself. The X-band transverse deflecting cavity is used to measure the energy phase, uh, phase phase distribution of the electron beam. From C1 to C3, which shows that without a wiggler or chicken, the phase space is relatively flat. With only the wiggler inserted, an energy modulation is applied. And with both the wiggler in and the chicken on, the phase space gets rotated. And with a sharp current spike with a large energy charge is produced. By matching the angulator taper to the electron beam chirp, soft X-ray atosecond FBO pulses with hundreds of gigawatt can be generated. Actually, can produce isolated atosecond X-ray pulses with tens of microjoules of pulse energy, increasing the available pulse energy at a soft X-ray domain by almost six order of magnitude compared to HG source. Such high intensity are sufficient for atosecond pump, atosecond probe experiment. In our case, ESAS can be easily applied to generate tires of pulses at different colors using the split angulator mode. Basically, we use it twice. In, the, in this scheme, the LCS angulator is divided into two parts separated by a magnetic chicken in the middle. Uh, the magnetic chicken delays the bunch uh, with respect to the FEO. So basically, we lay the ESAS current spike within the first angulator and produce the first pulse. And we then laser it again in the second in the second angulator to produce the second pulse. The minimum delay between the pump pro pulse pairs is limited by the slippage of the first pulse in the second angulator section. So probing dynamics on time scale externally below one femtosecond requires the generation of atom second pulse pairs with variable delay down to sub femtosecond level. Such some femtosecond delay can be achieved in the split angulator mode of ESASI by setting the pro pulse as the harmonic of the pump pulse. So sub femtosecond omega pulse can be generated by laser the ESASI beam in the first angulator, for sure, right? After a magnetic chicken, at a second, two omega pro pulse are produced by reamplifying the electron beam microbunch created by the pump pulse. As a result of harmonic amplifier, 
Uh, it only takes one angulator to amplify the power of the propuls to achieve one gigawatt level or even 10 gigawatt level. The minimum delay between the pulses can be shorter than 0.5%, uh, 0.5 femtosecond. The figure on the bottom left shows 10 shots of 260 EV pound, 520 EV probe X FEO simulations. Transparent line shows 100 individual shots of pump probe pulses, and the solid line shows the average pump probe pulses in the time domain. On the bottom right, we show the histogram of delay between two pulses, with the average delay around 0.5. Femtosecond and a delay de jitter defined as the RMS to be like 200 nanoseconds. To make a better use of the nanosecond pump probe technique, an accurate calibration of delay between pump and probe pulses in each FEL configuration is needed. Then we'll use the nanosecond street camera to measure the delay between the pump probe pulses. The experiment setup is shown in the top of the slide. So at a second pump probe pulses are generated by laser the ESAC beam in the split angulator mode. Uh, magnetic fields in two angular sections are tuned to make the first pulse to be 375 EV and probe pulse at a 70, 750 EV. Pump probe pulse pairs irradiate CF4 in the presence of a circularly polarized 1.3 micron laser field. The 375 EV pump pulse irradiate carbon and generate uh, photoelectrons with 92 EV kinetic energy. The 750 EV probe pulse irradiate fluorine and generate kinetic energy. Uh, fully electron with kinetic energy at uh, 60, uh, 63 EV. The momentum distribution, the resultant, the fully electrons is encoded in a velocity map imaging spectrometer. The circularly polarized laser field maps the temporal profile of the electron emission onto the momentum uh, measured at the detector. When electrons are released from the molecule following an interaction with the X-ray pulse, their trajectory is altered by the presence of the infrared laser. This is called the Alessand Street camera. The interaction changed the final uh, electron momentum distribution, which is measured at the detector. In a semi-classical approximation, the final momentum of an ionized electron is given by the momentum of the electron without the IR laser field, plus the vector potential of the IR laser field at the ionization time. As a result, full electrons ionized at different times get different momentum change. The delay between two pulses can be estimated from the difference in momentum shifts of two photon lines. Okay, so on the left hand side, I show uh, the schematics for of the coaxial VMI. So X ray pulse uh, plotted as the purple oscillation line, ionized the gas molecules uh, shown as the black points to release photoelectrons in the presence of a circular polarized string laser plotted as the red spiral line. The following electrons are imaged by the coaxial VMI to reach an MCP channel in the back, and that their trajectory are indicated by the dashed green arrow. Basically, the VMI measures the 3D momentum distribution of ionized, the, the maps the 3D momentum distribution of ionized photo electron into a 2D momentum distribution. To better understand the second string camera, how the second string map camera measures the pump probe delay, here we first demonstrate how the streak in fact looks like with only one second. On the top right, uh, I show a video of a strict CVMI signal. In this video, the CVMI measures the neon one as photon electron ionized by 905 EV at a second pulse. When there is no circular polarized streaking laser, the, pro uh, the projected photon electron signal on the MCP shows an unshifted dipole distribution as shown in the panel A on the bottom. The transparent purple circle shows the edge of the n strict photon line. And each frame, of this video shows a single shot measurement of stricted photon electron signal. On the bottom right, panel A shows the unstricted single shot image. Panel B shows the stricted shot image. We can see that photon line is shifted. And the panel C shows the difference map between a single shot strict image from the average unstricted image. We see that you know, it's a difference map. So we see positive volume in some direction and negative volume in some direction. So we see this red and blue things. As we can see, the streaking direction in this panel C is likely to the four o'clock. Okay, as we said before, the momentum shift of photon electron is related to the vector potential of the uh, streaking laser in, at the ionization time. Given the temporal delay between the arrival time of the pump and probe pulses, the streaking angle of the a photon line ionized by the pump pulse is different from that one to the probe pulse since two ionizations 
happen at a different time. The pump probe delay can be measured from the difference in streaking angle of two phone lines. So here we show our data analysis of our most in the recent two color streaking. I choose uh, a very short delay and a pretty long delay. Two figures shown in this slide are different maps between streak and unstreaked image. By looking at the outer photo line, uh, we can see that you know the outer photo line uh, and on the left hand side is straight to the 11 o'clock, and on the right hand side is straight to the 7 o'clock. In both figures, the inner frequent line are chosen to, you know, straight to the up. The delay between two pulses is estimated in each case, is estimated from the difference of streaking angle. So in the left hand side situation, it's like there's no engine, no engine, she can delay, and there are two angulators for the same color. So the delay is like 300 ish at a second. For the, for the second case, the delay in the chicken is like one final second, and we'll use four angulators for the second pulse. And the average delay in this case is like 1.6 final second. Okay, so we have also done start to end simulations to benchmark our data analysis of two color streaking. Okay, uh, we have done start to end simulations to benchmark, to benchmark our data analysis of two color streaking. Here we compare simulations to data, to data analysis uh, for shortest delay point. The four shortest delay points are no chicken delay plus one, two, three, and four angulators for the second column. We see that FEAL simulation scores pretty well with the experimental data. The pulse energy is still decent, say a few microjoule, when there is only one angulator for the second color and the pulse is pretty short, say just like you know, 300 L second, uh, 200 L second. The pulse length is still pretty short, say just like you know, 600 L second. And the data jitter is still pretty small, say only around it's like 150 L second when there are four angulators for the same color. I mean, we laser a lot, but it's still clean and the delay is still stay stable. The delay between pump pro pulses uh, is increased by 150 L second by adding one angulator. This means that we can do a you know pump pro L second pump pro uh, delay scan with a pretty high uh, time resolution. Okay. Then we apply our L second pump probe technique to observe ultra fast electron motion in the real time. The goal is to do impulsive removal of valence electron with X pulse and study the migration of valence pole. In our L second campaign experiment, the pump pulse is at 260 EV and produce a valence hole and create coherent superpositions of ionic state. And the probe pulse at 520 EV probes the population valence hole. The figure on show on the bottom shows the, the numerical simulations of the dynamical hole chart at the OH, NH2, and C, uh, and the carbon ring in the parallel amino phenol calculated with 100 shots of start to end simulations of 260 EV FEO pump pulses. So here we show the schematics of our Allison campaign experiment on LSS. The Allison campaign on LSS is led by James Cryan, Peter Water, and Agostino Martinelli. The second 200, 260 EV pump, 520 EV probe is made by the split angular mode of ESAC with omega-2 omega setup. The magnetic bottle at the end station measures the kinetic energy of the ionic, like, uh, ionized electron. The 2D color map shown on the right-hand side shows the measured electron spectrum in the magnetic bottle as a function of the photon energy and the kinetic energy of the electron with the probe pulse only. The line separated the green area and the white area uh, shows the upper band of kinetic energy of the photo electrons ionized from, from valence, sorry, from valence orbit. When the photon energy is higher than 530 EV, the probe pulse itself can excite oxygen 1S electron to an unoccupied valence, valence orbit or even continuum to produce a core vacancy. The core hole can be fueled by an outer shell electron and lead to an injection of OJ electron. Below 530 EV, we see little OJ signal with probe pulse only, since the profile of the full energy of the probe pulse only is not high enough to produce a core vacancy to trigger OJ process. However, the story is different when there are both pump and probe pulses. The pump pulse ionizes an outer valence electron and leaves a valence hole. With the valence hole, the probe pulse below 530 EV can produce a core vacancy and make the OJ effect happen by exciting the oxygen 1S electron to the valence hole rather than an unoccupied energy valence orbit or even continuum. The 2D map shown on the middle uh, shows the pump probe data subtracted, subtracted by the probe data only. By integrating over probe uh, photon energy between 522 EV and 530 EV, we see electron signal similar to normal OJ process. 
Okay, here's our preliminary data analysis from, our, from this expert. So as we said, below 530 EV, the propulse only can make the OJ, uh, 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 be below 500, uh, 530 EV, the propulse can only make the OJ effect happen when there's a valence hole. So the valence hole is measured by comparing the OJ signal between the pump probe data and the probe only data. The y-axis uh, shown on the figure in the middle shows the relative change of pump probe signal compared to the probe signal. So we are very excited to see a time-dependent effect with a fast decay flowing by a ripple at around two to four femtosecond. Okay, there is all my talk today. Here's my conclusion. So we generate sub femtosecond to color pump probe pulses with control delay uh, by split angular mode of ESASI. And you know, the delay can be down to, you know, maybe 30, uh, 300 seconds through the omega-2 omega generation. And the angular streaking measurement of, of the pump probe uh, delay shows very good agreement with FEL simulation. And then we have applied our uh, sub femtosecond two color pump probe techniques to study the ultra-fast charge migration uh, in amino phenol. I think this is the first at a second pump, at a second pump, uh, at a second pump, at a second probe FEL experiment made so far. Okay, thank you so very much. Any questions, comments? Thanks a lot, Zhang. Uh, Zhang Wen, sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> It was a beautiful, <laughs> it was a beautiful talk and with the well, uh, results uh, that was, uh, uh, perhaps you can actually come back and uh, uh, to the last year here. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm again, encouraging for questions, just please, Go ahead. This is the last speaker of today with the impressive uh, autocephal pump and probe measurements. Mm. And um, so one back, uh, one more back actually to me. So I was actually, uh, again, because you were very fast. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, because there are a lot of barriers. <laughs> and I, uh, could you actually, again, uh, uh, just for me, while uh, maybe someone else uh, prepare for just one or two maximum question, uh, again, explain me uh, a little bit what happens uh, um, when we have only the probe, we can actually create. Uh, so, uh, so Laura, can you see my mouse? Yeah, I can see your okay, mouse. Okay, okay. So this is, this is the probe only. Uh, so it's a little, yes. I mean, yeah, the probe only, the probe energy is like between 500 and 0, 05 and 550 EV, right? So first of all, we see a slope here. This is pretty, yes. uh, you know, pretty, you know, pretty familiar in the, in the OJ spectrum, right? So basically just like given the same IP, the maximum kinetic energy of ionized electron, ionized from wireless state, is just like given by the photon energy minus IP, right? So we see a linear slope here. We see a linear slope here. Uh, Oh, can you see my mouse now? Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry about yes. that. Yeah. yeah, when the photo energy is pretty high, we see a lot of signals here, right? This comes mm -hmm. from, so the energy, the, the, the high density color map in this area comes from the resonance OJ. When the, when the pulse energy, uh, when the photo energy at 535 EV can directly excite oxygen 1S electron to an unoccupied uh, valence orbit. When that photo energy is even higher, we can directly do normal OJ. Just basically, we ionize the oxygen YS electron, kick it out, produce a, a, a core vacancy, and trigger the OJ process. Right? In our experiment, what we are really interested in is like between 522 and 527 EV, which is close to the oxygen resonance, but with the probe pulse itself, uh, without the uh, valence hole, the photon energy is not high enough to produce a core vacancy and trigger the O'Shea process. So our story is different uh, with pump probe pulse from the probe only. When there is a pump pulse, the pump pulse at around 260 EV can ionize an electron from the valence orbit and produce a valence hole there. So in this case, the probe pulse at around 222 to 227 EV no longer need that high energy to directly excite oxygen 1S directly to uh, originally unoccupied high energy uh, valence orbit or even continue. Now, 
we can make the uh, oxygen 1S to go from the core orbit to the hole produced by the pump pulse. That's our story. So that's the reason just like with, with the probe pulse only, this cannot happen. With the help of the pump pulse, there's a hole. We can let the electron go to the hole, producing a core vacancy and trigger the OJ process. That's right, in our data analysis, we compare the pump probe data to the probe only data. And we see just like in the difference map, how many OJ electron signal can we see? And that indicate okay. the, the core hole population at a given delay time. This is the schematics of our experiment. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you. Is there, yep. is there anybody wanting to ask a question? Sorry. Now that I see, and since we are already late for the post session and Tosha is already ready to chair, um, well, thanks a lot, Zain, for your presentation. Um, Thank you so much. Amazing results. And um, I leave the floor to the next chair, Tosha, for the post session, where I'm ready to already took 10 minutes out. So uh, bye to everybody and have a wonderful post session. Soon. Hello, everybody. So I will just uh, lay down um, how we follow the poster session here. So every speaker will have uh, five minutes uh, for their presentation, and that will not be followed by any questions here. We will create breakout rooms like yesterday, where each of the speakers can uh, present, and you can ask your questions directly to the poster presenters over there in the breakout rooms. Um, and uh, the first speaker um, of this poster session is Dr. Marta Murillo from the Universidad Com uh, Complutense de Madrid. And um, she will talk about femtosecond XUV IR induced photodynamics in the methyl iodide cation. I, require, I request Dr. Murillo uh, to start the presentation. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, wait. Now? Yes, but it's not in the pre Yes, now it's fine. Okay, thank you very much. So, good evening, everyone. Today I'm going to present my work entitled From the Second XUV Infrared Induced Photodynamics in the Methyl Iodide Cation. This work was performed between the group of the Complutense University of Madrid, headed by Luis Bañares, and the group of Oleg Kornilov at the Max Born Institute, thanks to a laser lab bureau project. So first of all, I would like to introduce you the electronic structure of the methyl iodide cation. As you can see in this diagram, it has a ground electronic state, which has two spin orbit components and yields to the formation of methyl in correlation with iodine. Then we have a first excited state, which is mainly bounded, and pretty associative and can lead to the generation of methyl in correlation with iodine plus. And three different vibrational modes can be populated upon excitation of this state. And then we have a manifold of repulsive surfaces, which are called the B state manifold, and basically correlate with different electronic states of the iodine plus cofragment. So, what we did in this work was a evaluating the dynamics of the methyl iodide cation upon excitation with the ninth harmonic of 800 nanometer radiation selected by a time-delayed compensated monochromator. This type of monochromator uh, allows us to set one of the given harmonics of the broadband, but preserving the temporal resolution for kind of a second experiment, okay? And then we observe how these uh, dynamics could be modified in presence of mid-intensity infrared pulses with an intensity that allow us to avoid processes such as strong field ionization or Coulomb explosion. So first of all, what we did was obtain the photoelectron spectrum for the methyl iodide cation just in presence of the XUV radiation. And what we could observe is that we can populate both spin orbit components of the ground state as well as the first excited state with a high vibrational content that peaks around 15 if we consider the carbon iodine stretch mode. Then the type of light mass spectrum reveal a major signal for the methyl plus signal so that according to the diagram that I presented earlier, 
uh, basically the ground is the first excited state is dissociating uh, through the first uh, through the ground state by means of internal conversion leading to the generation of methyl plus and this is occurs by means of an statistical uh, mechanism but what happens if we put like time delay uh, mid intensity infrared pulses afterwards well here you can see the kinetic energy release maps for iodine plus and methyl plus cofragments. We can see a clear oscillatory structure we are, when we are uh, uh, in pump proof, uh, positive pump proof delays. This uh, oscillatory structure was analyzed by means of a first Fourier transform analysis and revealed an oscillation period that is very close to the carbon iodine stretching mode in the first excited state. In the case of methyl plus, this uh, yield increases, whereas the iodine plus uh, yield increases. Then we obtain the uh, corresponding transients for the different cofragments, and they reveal three different components, the oscillatory structure, a slow component in the picosecond time scale, and a fast component either in the subfentosecond time scale. Then the experimental results were uh, uh, supported by some theoretical calculations by Jesus González Vázquez from the Autónoma University of Madrid. First of all, uh, he performed the, uh, per performed the XUV photoelectrum spectrum, Basically, it revealed the same, uh, the same as the experimental findings, and then he performed some th uh, trajectories of the wave packet. Basically, the, the wave packet remains oscillating in the first electronic state, but some of the trajectories can escape the potential well, leading to the generation of iodine plus. He couldn't predict the formation of methyl plus, that is what we can observe at the experimental level. So what happens uh, when the infrared comes afterwards? Well, in principle, we could have like uh, dynamics from the ground state, but it's very bounded. So that we would need like several photons to reach any photoassociation pathway. So that we despise this mechanism. And then from the E state, well, the mechanism should, go, so, should come from the E state. And basically we can have a down mechanism down to, down to the ground state with leads to no fragmentation. And on the other hand, we can have a pump mechanism. In this pump mechanism, when, where the wave packet is propagating outwards of the uh, Frank Condon region, can uh, absorb one of multiple photons, and this would lead to the generation of iodine plus because we are accessing the B-state manifold with, uh, as I told you, uh, it correlates with different electronic states of this uh, cofragment. And these uh, cofragments will have like low kinetic energy, energy as reflected by the kinetic energy release maps obtains at experimental level. So taking into account the experimental uh, findings as well as the theoretical calculations, we can uh, propose the following mechanism for this photo, photo ion, uh, ion use dynamics. So the slow component that we observe in the transient can be attributed to a transfer of the wave packet from the, ground, uh, from the first electronic state down to the ground state by means of internal conversion. But if we are launching the infrared pulses, this uh, pathway becomes le less favorable so that we observe the signal depletion in methyl plus signal and the enhanced signal of iodine plus. On the other hand, the fast decay at 83 femtosecond is a competing mechanism in which the wave packet, which is uh, like oscillating in the first electron electronic state, can absorb photons uh, up to the B-state manifold leading to the generation of iodine plus. And this would lead uh, to the reducing of the population of the E-state to this internal conversion mechanism. And on the other hand, as I told you, there is an oscillatory structure as well in the transient, which is basically the wave packet that is oscillating in, in this uh, potential well, but can be proved that by the infrared pulses that are leading to photoassociation in the B-state manifold. In principle, if we had uh, performed like longer pump probe delay, uh, we could observe the, the phasing of the wave packet and the later revival of it, but we couldn't observe it because we performed be like very short pump probe delays. So this is all. Thank you, Dr. Murillo, uh, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, the next uh, presenter is Dr. Jakub Benda from the Charles University, Prague, and he will be talking about molecular rabbit calculations using the time-independent multi-photon R matrix method. Do we have uh, Dr. Benda in the audience? Oh, yes, I'm working oh, on yes. it. <laughs> 
So, so um, do you see my presentation now? Yes, I do. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You. So good, good afternoon. Thank you for the possibility to present at this meeting. This work has been done at the Charles University in Prague and also at the Open University in the United Kingdom. We were uh, theoretically investigating investigating the well-known rabbit uh, interference experiment where two, two photon absorption pathways interfere and give rise to the well-known uh, rabbit spectrogram. The objective of rabbit is uh, uh, to find uh, the so-called uh, rabbit time, de time delay or sideband time delay, which is the absolute offset of this interference pattern. And it can be calculated uh, from the second order perturbation theory by means of uh, the respective two, uh, two photon ionization amplitudes corresponding to the two pathways. This is difficult for uh, a general target so the conventional way to obtain this uh, theoretically is uh, the asymptotic uh, approximation, which uh, results in a combination or sum of two terms, one that corresponds very roughly to uh, the ionization of uh, the target by the first photon, and a second term, which again, uh, very, very inaccurately corresponds to absorption or emission of uh, an infrared photon by the photoelectron. In the poster, we point out that there should be a third uh, term, which is normally neglected, but is very important in some systems. And this term is uh, the absorption or emission of the infrared photon by the residual uh, ion. This results in uh, coupling of uh, the final channels and is important, for example, in carbon dioxide uh, in excited states. So this is one thing that we have in the poster. And now regarding the, the accurate calculations of uh, the sideband time delay, uh, let me quote uh, from Dahlstrom and others uh, from 2013. They say that going beyond the approximations given here, this is the, the green part, namely performing exact up initial computations of the two photon ionization matrix elements in polyelectronic systems is out of reach of present computational capabilities. With that, we can't uh, agree any longer because uh, a few months ago, we published a time independent uh, multi photon method based on the R metric theory, which uh, calculates exactly amplitudes of this kind. Uh, multi photon above threshold ionization, ionization amplitudes uh, by means of splitting the physical space into several subregions and applying various uh, levels of the theory in each of them. This allows us to calculate the measurable, the sideband uh, rabbit time delays uh, for any molecule uh, and any photon and photoelectron energies. And here I'm showing some examples that we have in the poster. So we calculated the sideband time delays for uh, nitrogen, comparing them to the recent experience, experiments of uh, Lurio and Anandi, and found a very nice, very beautiful agreement. Similarly, for carbon dioxide, we see a very good agreement between our calculations and the experimental data. And there is also a, a fair agreement in case of uh, H2O. We have uh, more results in the poster, which you are welcome to visit. And uh, for now, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That really intrigues a lot of uh, interest. Um, the next speaker is Miss Barbara uh, Stakova from the Comenius University of Bratislava, and she will be talking on electron-induced fluorescence of oxygen. Yes, hello. Hello. We can hear you. Okay. Yes, I'm and going you can also to share see my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Uh, but it's not in the presentation mode. Yes, now it's fine. Okay. So I may start, right? Okay, so my name is Barbara Stachova and uh, I am in the first year of my PhD studies at Cominius University in Bratislava, Slovakia. And I would like to present, to give a little presentation about our work 
called electron induced fluorescence of oxygen. Electron molecule interactions are of considerable interest in atmospheric chemistry and astrophysics as they are relatively abundant processes in the universe. Their observation provides knowledge on the processes that occur throughout the whole interaction, as well as the implementation of innovative methods in the industry. Uh, the main motivation for our research was the spectroscopic data from the Rosetta mission, which was the first one to orbit a comet's nucleus. In particular, it was comet 67P Churyumo Gerasimenko. Uh, the study of comets and cometary processes uh, is of great importance as they are relatively pristine leftovers from the early ages of our solar system. One of Rosetta's findings was the first detection of molecular oxygen at a comet. And as it, as it gathered the spectroscopic data, it also detected the signal from optically forbidden transitions, which suggests that uh, the cometary processes are not only um, photon induced, but also induced by low energy electrons. Here on the right, you can see uh, the scheme of our experimental apparatus, and it is uh, based on the crossed electron and molecular beams method. Uh, this takes place in a vacuum chamber. Uh, one of the phenomena that occurs during this interaction is photon emission, uh, which is a result of uh, the, the excitation of excited species. Uh, this photon signal is then gathered and analyzed, producing two types of uh, data, emission spectra and emission cross-section. Uh, at first, we measured the emission spectrum of uh, oxygen, and this spectrum is measured at 50 electron volts electron energy, ranging from 200 to 650 nanometers. This spectrum is corrected for apparatus sensitivity and also calibrated for absolute values of intensity. We identified the second negative system of O2 plus and its vibrational transitions. And uh, this is uh, depicted in violet and also some bands from the second negative system of O2 plus and uh, several atomic lines of oxygen. We also measured the dependency curves on the, of the cross section on the electron energy. This is done at fixed wavelengths corresponding to specific transitions. Uh, they give the information about the probability of the given process occurrence and also about the threshold energy of the process, which is the minimal energy needed to uh, needed for this process to be done. Um, the first curve represents the atomic line of oxygen. And here we can see that there are uh, two thresholds. Uh, the first one corresponds to the to the formation of just one oxygen atom, uh, just one excited oxygen atom, and the second threshold corresponds to the formation of two excited oxygen atoms. Uh, here on the right, uh, we have a curve that represents a band from the first negative system of O2 plus, and we can see that there is only one threshold. Uh, with the help of these dependency curves, uh, we calculated absolute emission cross-sections for each transition, and we bring a complete collection of absolute emission cross-sections for all these transitions at uh, electron energies ranging from 19 to 100 electron volts with one electron volt step. This is a major contribution uh, to previous research because uh, the emission cross sections are often calculated only for discrete values of uh, electron energy or are not determined uh, in absolute values. Uh, the collected data is then used as reference data and will be helpful in the analysis of spectroscopic data from the already mentioned Rosetta mission. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Dr. Cornelia Hoffman from the University College London. 
and she will be talking about electron dynamics for higher order harmonic generation control. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and welcome everybody to my very quick presentation on electron dynamics for high order harmonic generation control, which is the result of a multinational collaboration. I prefer it, I myself am sitting currently at UCL. In the morning, Dino Habiovic already presented in his talk that if we don't use just plain old linear polarization in order to generate high harmonics, but instead use various tailored fields, we can get high harmonics with, our, with different polarizations. One approach which is often used is depicted here, a two-color counter-rotating circular field, which leads to a threefold symmetric driving field to ionize our gas target. And the resulting HHG spectrum has then doublets of right and left circularly polarized um, harmonics, as well as the three, multi um, three multiples, which are um, missing in the spectrum, obviously, for symmetry reasons. Another approach to um, expand on the method of HHG is to look at what happens if we are driving HHG in the presence of, for example, a nanostructure, which leads to a special dependence of the electric field due to plasmonic enhancement. And this plasmonic enhancement is usually characterized with a beta vector, which describes both the strength of the enhancement, depending on the spatial coordinate and in our calculation also, the direction of this enhancement specifically. For our project then we ask, well, what happens if we bring these two approaches together? What if we use this two color tailored field and combine that with a setup that results in a spatially dependent field enhancement? What happens to the spectrum? Well, Let's look at how the electrons behave in these different cases. In these plots, I'm showing the path of electron trajectories, which are ionized, they fly around, and they return back to their parent ion in order to recombine and thus contribute to HHG. And for a homogeneous case, so no enhancement, no spatial dependence of the field, obviously the path that all of these trajectories build um, is also uh, showing the same threefold symmetry as the underlying field, where ionizations which happen in one specific lobe of this field um, look like that and then build up the total heat map of all the possible trajectories where each component is rotated by 120 degrees. If we introduce a spatial dependence, in this case, the spatial enhancement is directly aligned with one of the lobes of our field as shown with the red arrows. Evidently, the path that all of our trajectories take looks very different. Most notably, electrons which are ionized in the third lobe, which is the one that is right before the field turns around and starts to align with the enhancement again. Here, of course, any conventionally called short trajectories just go out and come back again with this boost of energy, with the higher energy due to the enhanced field in this direction. On the other hand, electrons which are ionized in one of the other lobes only those paths which take two thirds or three thirds of the fundamental period come back from the same enhanced direction and thus have a weak probability of contributing to a higher energy in the radiation. Of course, this um, complicated dynamic also depends highly on 
the relative geometry of the enhancement and the driving field that we're choosing. So in the second example, the enhancement is not aligned with either one of the lobes and the resulting trajectories obviously look vastly different. What I've shown you here is how the electrons behave, but that then leads to um, a change in the high harmonic spectrum and also a change in the polarization of individual attosecond pulses in the entire train. And in my breakout room number four, I will be very happy to discuss all of these details and any other questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Andres Ordonis from ICFO, the Institute of Photonic Sciences. I'm sorry if I butchered the name. No, and, no, no. <laughs> um, he will be talking about enantial sensitive unidirectional light bend. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. As you just heard, the title of this work is an antisensitive unidirectional light bending. This work was very recently published in Nature Communications, and the co-authors are David Ayuso, who gave a talk in the previous session, Piero de Cleva, Misha Ivanov, and Olga Smirnova. So the motivation of this work was to understand how a chiral medium behaves when it is exposed to light with structured chirality. And what do I mean by structured chirality? Well, I mean that the chirality of the light changes as a function of position across the beam, like I show in this figure. It varies from negative to positive, or one could say from left-handed to right-handed to non-chiral and so on, as a function of position across the beam. So what we found was that uh, when this type of structural light interacts with left uh, chiral molecules, even harmonics are emitted at a certain angle, and this angle is exactly the opposite if we replace the left-handed molecules by their mirror images, by the right-handed molecules. So uh, structuring the chirality of the light leads to emission of light in different directions for opposite enantiomers, and this is what we mean by enantiosensitive unidirectional light bending. So now let's see in more detail what we actually did. So first of all, uh, we uh, have to generate light with structured chirality and the type of chirality we will use is not the usual optical chirality associated to circularly polarized light. Instead, we will use local chirality, which uh, is a type of chirality that we introduced a couple of years ago in this paper and which is the important type of chirality for nonlinear effects within the electric dipole approximation. I can comment further on that uh, in the breakout room. For now, it is enough to say that the Lissajous figure of the simplest locally chiral field looks like this. So it is made up of a field elliptically polarized in the xy plane rotating at frequency omega and a field linearly polarized along set with frequency 2 omega and this uh, second part causes this twist of the otherwise planar ellipse. Now to obtain the field with the opposite chirality we just have to change the relative phase between the two colors by pi and this yields uh, this other Lissajous figure which as you can see is the mirror image of this one. <clears throat> Uh, now, to generate uh, the field with a structured chirality like this, we take two beams and cross them at an angle of 2 alpha. Each beam carries frequencies omega and 2 omega, with omega linearly polarized in the xy plane, as you see in, in this diagram, and 2 omega linearly polarized along set. Now, the two beams differ only in the direction of propagation, and in the region where these two beams overlap, the polarization will be three-dimensional and it will change as a function of the x-coordinate in such a way that this structured local chirality results. At the minima it will look like that and at the maxima it will look like this. All right, so these are the parameters for the actual calculations. We have the wavelength about one micron, the intensities of the fields at omega and at two omega and the angle between the beams and uh, the focus diameter. Now, for the left enantiomer of randomly oriented fan shown, uh, this is the induced polarization, or, or if you want the near field, at the 12th harmonic as a function of position across the focus. 
So the black curve is the intensity and the blue curve is the phase. And this pattern repeats over and over for about uh, 200 nanometers, which is the focus diameter. Here I only show a small uh, part of that close to the center. Now, this is the corresponding intensity in the far field as a function of the angle of emission. So what do we see? We have sharp peaks under an envelope and the envelope is shifted towards negative angles. The sharp peaks are simply the result of having a periodic structure in the near field. So this is uh, not very surprising. The important thing is the shift of the envelope, which results from uh, the phase behavior, uh, the phase behavior that we see in the near field, which in turn is associated to this uh, change in the chirality of the light. For the right-handed fan shown, the same structure of, of the chirality produces the opposite um, the opposite profile in the phase in the near field and thus also the opposite shift in the far field so uh, as i showed in the previous slide we get opposite emission directions for opposite enantiomers and if you want to know more about this work you are welcome to join me in the breakout room thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much for the very nice presentation. The next speaker is Ms. Chao Truong um, from the Department of Physics, University of Central uh, Florida. And she will talk on towards a low cost short wave infrared light field uh, uh, synthesizer based on rotational nonlinearity. Hello, thank you for your introduction. Uh... Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Chou Chu, uh, a grad student from University of Central Florida. Today, I will present a low-cost light field synthesizer to get few cycles based on rotational nonlinearity. The uh, generating single uh, isolated at the second pearl requires sub two cycle pearls, which is an available directly from ultrafast laser. The traditional way to get short pearls that is using holocore fiber, uh, gas field holocore fiber for spectral broadening, and then the resulting spectrum will be compensated by using chirp mirror. This technique. Uh, depend on the chirp mirror whose spectral range and the group velocity dispersion uh, should be suitable with the uh, fiber output. In our poster, we will show an alternative and inexpensive way using bulk material to get few cyclopers uh, by using the molecular gas. So first of all, we should know how more how the spectrum of molecular gas is the main nonlinear process to cause spectral broadening in holocaust fiber is self-phase modulation in which the high intensity laser we call the chain of the refractive index. Instead of using atomic gas, if we use linear molecular gas, its rotational nonlinearity will additionally contribute to the chain of the refractive index. And this process will depend on the per duration. The experimental and simulated results show that the spectrum from N2O has the heavy and the redshift uh, when we're using 300, around 300 femtosecond per duration of utopium laser. Why is this? This can be explained by we looking at uh, the instantaneous frequency shift in the time domain. Here you can see the long wavelength side is uh, it generated almost at the same time when the per, the laser per pass through. Especially this long wavelength side has the negative shift. That means we can use the bulk material with the normal dispersion to compensate this. From this, we propose an experimental set of four light field synthesizer. The fiber outputs will be slitted and combined by two dichroic chirp mirror. The compression bulb with uh, bulk material will be characterized uh, by a second harmonic generation block. 
as you can see here, the um, uh, um, our, uh, we can get around uh, 27 femtosecond at uh, around 1100 nanometer uh, at uh, 1700 nanometer central wavelength, and we can also uh, get around 12 femtosecond per duration at 1100 nanometer. The com the retrieval of the combined beam can give up a femtosecond per duration. That is about two cycle at uh, 1256 nanometer central wavelength. Um, from this outlaw code uh, setup, this preliminary result uh, is promising for generate isolated after second per in the future. Thank you for your attention and welcome to my uh, poster presentation. Thank you very much. That brings us to the uh, end of the presentation part of this poster presentation uh, session. So now the breakout rooms are all open and I request all the speakers to go to their respective breakout rooms and all the other participants uh, to visit uh, the breakout rooms for further discussions. Uh, the breakout rooms will be open up till uh, 6 p.m. Uh, uh, Central European time. Now I already see some people moving. That's good. <laughs>